order. Um, all members are present. Um, we're going to go right on to item E on the agenda. Uh, this is a matter for discussion only. It's an ordinance to repeal and recreate the city zoning code. At this time, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Mr. Share is Mr. Share making yeah, a copy you, for you, Vince. You, you right oh, he's now. making you a copy. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, to the planning department. Okay. Well, we can get started, I think. Yeah. So this is so this is our meeting to and our time to kind of go over the tell us who you are please i don't think everyone knows who you okay, are okay good yeah. call i'm zach roder i'm a planner <laughs> um and tony Giron also. yeah planner. tony we know you he, i'm zach, a newer, newer planner yeah i think i've met most of you but <laughs> yeah. not all of you maybe thank you um so this is our proposed zoning code update and we've been working on this for a few months and are at a point where we want to bring it to you guys um to share um, you know all the all the big changes we're going to be doing, and get your input on. I think we have a, specifically. I think we have five kind of key things where we're going to be asking you guys. Um, you know, if you guys have any questions, comments, and then we're going to have you kind of vote on on some of the things as well informally, um, just to kind of give us some guidance about where we want to kind of keep taking this. I believe there are about five questions that we'll be asking yep. for your guidance. Yeah, and we'll go over kind of reviewing the kind of key changes throughout. So just to um, kind of a refresher on why we're doing this. Um, we've talked to this with you guys before. Um, we have kind of three key objectives with this zoning code update. So the overall number one thing is we want to make it easier to use. Right now it's very, very long, mm -hmm. burdensome, difficult for somebody who isn't like a legal expert to kind of determine what they can do with their property, can't do with their property. Uh, so we're going to be doing a lot of changes to make that easier. Uh, another goal is to build the amount of taxable value in the city. Um, we want to allow more density where appropriate, help property owners have more flexibility um, for development, um, and lower the burden for you know new projects. Um, and then our third objective is to really fit the West House of today and tomorrow. The last zoning code update was, the last real overhaul was done in 1995. <laughs> Um, and I mean, that was before I was born. I think I've mentioned this a few of you. Oh, come on, there you go. But <laughs> this is what it is. That hurt. That hurt. The best part is I used to tell that joke also. Yeah. But now I know. You're so fast and you can't. Yeah, no. <laughs> now I'm an old guy too. Yeah. Yeah. I know your audience. It's right. I can't believe that. Solid 30 pages of it okay. right there. So, yeah. what are, what are they same for you, Vince. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Steve, I was yeah. just starting to introduce it. Oh, good. Started. But, sure. um, yeah, I'll just finish up this slide here. So, yeah, we're going to, we, we want to really rethink this for thinking for today and in the future. There's a lot of parts of our code which are very outdated. Um, we don't need any more. And there's other things we want to, you know, as West Salis changes, we want to make sure we're going in the right direction. So, I'll turn over to Steve for uh, the, this next part. Okay, so yeah, we're going to go take you through the uh, the various highlights and sections of the uh, of the code that's been uh, prepared. Um, if you haven't had a chance to review it uh, as of yet, don't worry. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna hit the high points. There'll be time um, during and after for for questions and answers. So if you have any questions along the way, feel free to to let us know. All right, yeah, and these just so you guys know, these two sections we really won't be covering much on the changes in, in the administration kind of section and plan development section are very small, and so we're just going to really be focusing on those four in the middle there. All right, I can start here. All right, so the first big section um, is our district section. So this, you know, says, you know, this is where is, we establish our zoning districts and you know what can be built where, kind of is all built from from this section on. Um, so this is our proposed zoning um, district table. Um, we have very, it's very similar to what we have right now. We have a, a group of residential districts, a group of commercial districts, a group of manufacturing districts, and then our other districts, which are our park district and state fair uh, park district. Um, the changes to our zoning districts are really just concentrated in the residential districts. The other things aren't changing. So what we're going to be doing in this, what we're proposing in this update is to consolidate some of the residential districts. Uh, there's specifically four that we're going to be merging into other, other um, districts that are already there. Uh, the graph on the right actually shows the number of properties um, that are zoned each residential district in the city. You'll see there's certain ones, of, um, especially our RE district and RC2, where only a handful of lots in the entire city have that zoning. 
Uh, and what we what we see when we look at the zoning is that so a lot of these districts are, you know, there's very few of them, and they're very similar in the regulations to other districts. So we want to merge them uh, where possible um, to make our you know, zoning code um, easier to understand, more efficient. Um, it's just kind of this, these redundancies that we don't really need. Um, another benefit of this is we're going to be working to promote the conformance of our lots. Sometimes we have lots in some districts that they're, you know, they don't quite meet what the current district standards are, and by merging these, it'll kind of increase the amount of conformance we have for residential properties. So just going one by one then to look at these changes, uh, the first is to merge our RE district, currently called like our residential estate district, um, into the RA district, RA1 district, sorry. Uh, so the RE is in light blue there. It's There's just 30 properties on a couple blocks, and it'll be merging with the rest of the districts, or rest of the properties in the area. Here's an example, actually, of two neighbors. One is zoned RA1 on the left, and one is RE on the right. They don't look any different to me. They're very similar types of properties, these kind of larger single largely single-family properties. And so we want to kind of consider these together, and they'll just be called RA1. Zach, I have a question. Yes. What does RA stand for? R A is kind of just a designation. We have we have R A districts, R R B districts, and R C districts. So R A is largely more like detached homes, single family, and duplexes. Uh, R B is kind of the traditional neighborhood style, and you'll see that more in the east side of West Dallas, um, with this kind of smaller lots, and then you'll have a mix of housing types. And then R C is like larger still, so that's like more like apartment complexes. So it kind of goes A is smaller, B is middle, C is large. Is the largest. Are there any RE uses that are being used as RE estates? So they, estates is I think a kind of a grand term from when they eventually, when they created this uh, zoning. There were a number of uh, restrictive covenants uh, when, when the homes across just west of Hale were built. And I think for some reason, I think those restrictive covenants may have, because they were exclusive at the time, um, I think the zoning the city planner at the time may have picked up on that and just decided where well, we're going to call these something different from the rest of the residential zoning districts in the city. So we ended up with an RE district, which is just those 31 properties. And then the RA1 is like Orchard Hills and, you know, some of those other... So there's no use in RE that you're going to automatically put into RA... Yeah, RA. Nothing, no, nothing new. Nothing, have, yeah. nothing new. It's all we won't same. make anyone non-conforming, and there won't be anything that... You're not getting. Yeah, those are basically by merging it. Can't go and build a house for his maid and butler on his backyard. <laughs> you know? well, he, for an accessory dwelling unit, you could actually. That'll be <laughs> a good section. Later. We'll get into it a bit. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. That's where Fonzie lives. Yeah. <laughs> Above the garage. Yeah. <laughs> I could build one across the street. Maybe. Yeah, but the function of both of these districts is like larger yeah. lots and a single, you know, yeah. single okay. building. That's kind of, you know, why we want to merge them together. So the next one is going to be we're combining our RA4 district, which you see in light blue. It's really just in the southeast corner of the city, pretty much. There's actually a couple of random spots in the middle that are also zoned RA4. We're going to be merging that into the RA3 district. Um, here's some examples of the types of homes you might see in these districts. They're both pretty similar, kind of smaller, typically ranch-style homes on kind of you know small to moderate-sized lots. Um, and they, you know these ones good examples of ha having a very similar character, um, so we want to merge these together. Next is the RB district. So right now we have RB1 and RB2. RB2 is the dark blue. It's basically all of the residential area on the east side of West Dallas. RB1 is, and it was originally intended as this kind of transitional uh, district between some more commercial areas and some of the RA residential districts. Uh, there aren't a lot of differences though between the RB districts and we want to just combine these into one considering there's really not that many RB1 uh, you know, buildings at all. Uh, so that's another good example of just very similar types of regulations and t types of homes there. And here's examples of some of the homes that you'll see in these districts. And then RC is those kind of large multifamily kind of complexes. <laughs> Um, this, the dark blue is our RC2, and I believe, and then the light blue is RC1, I, I'm not sure, yeah. And then here's some pictures of what those look like. Um, the RC2 on the right, that's at seven, uh, 70th and Greenfield. Um, RC1 is, I think, 102nd in Lincoln. Yeah. Lincoln. So, yeah, those are just very similar styles of housing, and we want to kind of consider them just as one. 
That brings us to our next, I guess before we move on, any, any more questions about that or comments or anything? I just want to make sure that when we're doing this, we're not creating some unintended uses in, in other words, somebody's not going to be able to come here and say, hey, they couldn't build a duplex next to me before and now they're building a duplex on a 40 foot lot or something. Right, so so far with the, with the merging that's taking place from um, merging RE into RA, uh, that, that won't happen. With the uh, merging of RA3 into RA4, uh, I guess so none of that, to answer your question, none of that can happen. I guess some points later on, I guess, with respect to increasing the, um, the density. Uh, okay. In some cases, there, there will be a policy decision on that if you want to introduce some changes where perhaps to allow a little bit higher density in some traditionally single-family uh, districts, that'll be a, an option for you to okay. consider Mr. as we go. Mr. Chair, yeah. still, per se that uh, we have, I mean, uh, not just in my district, but throughout the uh, city that built those apartment complex yeah. on about three feet away from the uh, sidewalk years back, you know. So what happened uh, if a fire would occur, you know, the buildings get destroyed? So is anything that we can apply to uh, in case to get rebuilt it, not to build it in the same lot size, the same size building. Like I said, on 64th and Lincoln, you know, next to Richland, well, we have such huge apartments. You know, years ago they used to have a abiding right with the sidewalk, really. I was only yeah. two feet away. So if, if uh, the state statutes actually allows, it creates an allowance for um, uh, rebuilding a non-conforming structure. Yeah. So if there were, uh, you know, whether it be a, an act of God like a storm or something that knocked the house down or a fire, um, you could rebuild within the same, the same footprint. Same footprint, no change. Correct, right. Okay. So that's covered within the state statutes okay. and, and would Thank also you. be reflected in our, in our code as well. Yeah, I've always been kind of, uh, years ago, I think, uh, you know, the past planners, I think they they've done something. I, I think it was not really appropriate, you know. I, uh, I know Mayor Barlick uh, at that time, he, uh, he did a lot of things that, uh, I mean, I shouldn't talk about him, but uh, he did a <laughs> I mean, but, but, but that's what really happens. A lot, a lot of the uh, things were done because, 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 you know. You know, but building apartments close to the uh, sidewalks. <laughs> All right, ready for the next section? Uh, we're going to be talking about uses, and uh, we'll be mostly talking about commercial business uses. So just to go over some of the terms here, we're still keeping the term permitted use, which just basically means any use that's allowed versus not permitted. Uh, limited use uh, is permitted if it meets certain criteria. So for example, tobacco retailer can't be within 1,000 feet of parks, schools, and other tobacco retailers. And uh, the biggest change here is that we're changing our terminology of special use to conditional use, just because it makes more sense It's you know, in, in the word, and uh, it's, it's the same term that other municipalities use as well. So here's some of the changes we're making. We're going to be removing some of the outdated uses, for example, mail order catalog stores and millinery shops, uh, and we'll also be organizing by general categories. So for example, retail, service, civic, uh, and within those, uh, we'll, we're consolidating even further. So for example, uh, the table to the right is a list of several of the older uses uh, that have, they all have the same permissions across the board, and we're consolidating those into, for example, uh, bike shop, book, bookstore, clothing store, they all can fit into neighborhood retail. And we'll also still be uh, regulating some of the sensitive uses individually, so uh, tobacco retailer again, for example, or alcohol beverage sales, or kennels, for example. We want to make sure that those have their own, uh, they're permitted in certain districts and have their own uh, regulations. We're also updating where some of these uses can be located. So I'll just go down the list of the most important uses. So tobacco retailer, we're not, not permitting that in the C1 district. Kennel will be removed from the C4 district, not permitted. 
uh, event space and theater, smaller ones, less than 5,000 square feet, will be permitted in C2, C3, and C4. And larger theaters will be a conditional use in C2, C3, and C4. Daycares were permitted in the downtown, and we are removing that. Uh, sport shooting range, uh, we're having those be not permitted in C2 and C3, but still permitted in C4 and, and the manufacturing districts. Substation distribution will be a conditional use in parklands and wireless communication structures will be not permitted in C3 and C4. Tony, yes. on the wireless, does that, in, I mean, that 5G is like, would that mean we're not getting 5G? 5G sits on like every uh, tower or every yeah. block, doesn't it? Yeah, so there's a difference. That's different there's a that, difference. That's not what we're talking about. Yeah, here. so uh, those would be. We have. The, I think it's called wireless co-location right now, right? Right. It, right. It's it's a. You can still put them, use them as accessory uses on any property, pretty much in any district. Okay. This is for if, you know, Verizon wanted to use a whole property to build a huge radio to, radio okay. tower, okay. just for you know a huge antenna or something. That's what this kind of would be. A, it's a single structure just for that. So yeah. So you're, you're saying, essentially, we're telling them they can't build any new antennas in the city of West Dallas, except for... It's okay as a secondary use of a property, but if you're going to use a whole oh, property... It can't, be the, it can't be the sole use. Yeah, you can't okay. use... Like, we don't want somebody to put, you know, right next to, you know, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, think of, like, the Panda Express, I guess, on a Highway 100 in Cleveland. Yeah. That's zone C4 right now. And right now, you could take up, use that property and build a huge radio tower on it. And, and there'd be no other use there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, exactly. And so we don't want that to be the sole use of a property if it's not in the manufacturing district. It's be an accessory use. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll also be introducing a new use called Commercial Light Industrial Flex. So uh, we really like the example of Abel and Kohler over on Hydro 100, uh, where they have the uh, showroom in the front and the distribution center in the back. So uh, the definition is shared light industrial and commercial use with the commercial use being associated with the light industrial use. We wanna make sure that we don't include self-storage into this definition. So those will be not allowed within this new use. Uh, some numbers we're working with right now is within C3, uh, we're, we're suggesting 20% or more must be consumer oriented and in C4 it would be 10% or more. If you all have suggestions, we are open to them. And, and then this would be uh, conditional use in C3 and C4 and permitted in the manufacturing districts. That brings us to accessory uses. So Tony just spoke <laughs> about principal uses, uh, uh, the, the primary use of the property. Accessory uses are a subordinate use to the, um, to the principal use. So Really, all of these things would be would be allowed uh, currently now, more or less, as a, in a as an accessory use. So there's really nothing new here, but we're just reorganizing it into a table, and then using the same format with you know P for permitted, uh, C for conditional, L for limited use, um, and then going across the top with the different zoning districts. So for instance, uh, in just going right off the top with an accessory dwelling unit, uh, we'll get into those next. What the, what they are. But say, for instance, you wanted to build a small little uh, accessory house on your property, a small cottage that you could rent out, or you could have your uh, a family member live in it. Um, uh, you know, you live in your primary residence, but in the ba in the backyard, you have a, a glorified uh, shed or house to, to put uh, an in line, for instance. So, um, those would all be allowed as a limited use across the board in all of our residential uh, zoning districts and then some of our C2, C3, and C4 uh, commercial districts where, where there is occasionally some um, uh, single family or two family homes. And this would be accessory dwelling units, sort of getting ahead of myself here, but they would be focused on single or two family homes. Um, and then, you know, drive throughs are accessory to a restaurant, for instance. So those are, again, our com uh, conditional uses within the commercial zoning. Kennels, we had talked about kennels a little bit. Uh, the principal use of kennel is allowed, I think, in an M1 and M2 zoning district as proposed in this ordinance. But if you're a veterinary clinic and you happen to have a boarding 
accessory use, uh, you happen to offer some boarding or an overnight stay for, for animal, uh, it would be allowed in the commercial zoning districts as uh, the C2, C1 and C2, uh, C1 being our downtown area, C2 a neighborhood commercial area, uh, as a conditional use, and then a limited use in, um, in the other commercial and manufacturing zoning district. So as a limited use, it's, it's allowed, but there are some stipulations. So there might be, um, you know, in the case of a conditional use uh, in the downtown area, the reason they're conditional in C1 and C2 for kennels, that is, uh, I, would, I, would, I would imagine that, you know, if, if you're going to have an outdoor, if you propose an outdoor kennel, um, we probably have a stipulation in the ordinance that says no outdoor, it has to be an indoor boarding. Uh, as an accessory, whereas in the C3, C4, and M districts, you could have the, the option for an outdoor option like the Poly Animal Clinic and Highway 100 in Oklahoma. So, Steve, uh, could you remind us which of these would trigger a neighborhood or public hearing where the neighbors get to weigh in on it? Uh, the conditional uses. Conditional uses. Right, yeah. Yeah, limited use again. That'd be like that. Just be a standard setback. They can come limited in. is is allowed, but notified. subject to these standards. You know, it would, which could be you know well, anything up there with the C, yeah. would generate a public hearing and neighbor notification. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So, um, some of the newer, um, I guess there are some newer um, accessory uses, and not to say that we wouldn't allow them now, but calling them out specifically here, solar energy systems, uh, wind energy systems are, are noted up there as, as newer. You see that becoming more relevant and obviously more uh, prolific in the, in the future. So, um, you know, we just want to call them out in advance within our update here. That's okay. Good. okay. Gotcha. And we talked a little bit about accessory dwelling units. Again, an accessory use focused primarily on um, single and two family homes. Um, in other words, if you have a four family, you can't build a small little cottage in your background or in your backyard for, for a, an accessory dwelling unit or ADU. Um, so these are just, again, just a smaller uh, house or cottage on the same property as your primary residence. And there are some benefits to these. I mean, they offer, you know, citizens of West Dallas that own properties uh, a little bit extra flexibility where you could potentially make a little bit offset your mortgage on your primary residence. Um, it does offer some um, uh, another housing option for people that want to rent. Um, maybe they don't want to live in a big apartment, but they'd like a more residential neighborhood setting. This is a, a great way to introduce that to the city. Uh, Wauwatosa has, um, has this allowance within their zoning code, and our, um, our proposed ordinance really is more or less mimicking what Wauwatosa has. Um, in Wauwatosa, they do have a little bit um, some I guess design criteria as part of their uh, accessory dwelling units where the accessory dwelling unit needs to match the primary residence in terms of like the roof pitch, uh, the siding or trim. If it's a brick veneer, something like that would need to sort of tie in with the primary residence. Not a bad idea uh, and it's something something to consider, uh, but uh, I just wanted to put that out there. So, But you can only have one, one per lot. So on your residential lot, uh, single or two family, you can only do one of these and um, it would have to be I guess a single family, you can't build another duplex ADU. It would have to be a single single unit, uh, dwelling unit. And um, in, in terms of taxable value, we feel that, you know, obviously these would have to meet building code. You'd have to pull a building permit to build one of these on your lot. It would have to meet certain setback requirements and um, design requirements if, if so be, if need be. And, um, but it would, it would add to the taxable value and increase the density of, you know, in some cases, some of our neighborhoods. I don't think everybody's going to do one, but, um, you know, certainly it, it would be an option for, um, for those that are interested to consider. And we have been getting a number of concerns or questions, uh, you know, over the past number of years. I'd like to do an accessory dwelling unit. Can, can I do it? And, well, the answer's been no, not yet. So this is at least one option. Steve, I, I like the idea of having some design criteria because yeah. I think that's very important. Okay. Um, are there any limitations to the amount of uh, uh, lot size that you that you have to have to do this? Because I, I certainly wouldn't want to see one of these on a 30-foot lot in the first district where you got the house and the garage and now you got nothing but a all dwelling in a 30-foot lot. That's a, that brings up a good point too in, is in that um, one thing we're going to be considering with this zoning code update is increasing some of the 
um, buildable area in the RB district because a lot of times people aren't able to build certain things on their property that other people can because their lots are so small. Um, and I think with those smaller lots, we would definitely, our limitations would kind of prevent them from you know, building out a whole new building for their ADU. But there's a style, if you actually, I guess you can see it right here, yeah. there's a style where you do an above a garage type accessory dwelling unit. And something like that would probably be more appropriate for the RB district with those smaller 30 foot lots. I'm, I'm just thinking we're already parking impacted on the east end of town. Mm -hmm. Is this a wise move to, to do in, in areas where you have small lots and not enough parking on the, on the properties to begin with, they're parked on the streets. Um, I, I certainly can see that happening on the west end of town where you have bigger lots. Uh, it's not an issue. I just, I'm a little concerned about the east end. Okay. Uh, Steve, I yeah. have a question. Using my home as an example, um, I have a duplex. I have a sizable lot, the average size lot. Um, if I wanted to do an accessory dwelling, could I, being I have a duplex already, so it's not subjected to just like a single family property? Yes, you may. Okay. Yeah, according, at least in this draft, you, you could. In the okay. current code, you couldn't, but in our proposed, you could. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For the I, utility companies to have to have to pay to have it moved, mm -hmm. and so that, all that is within the criteria of what we would require. Correct? Absolutely. I mean, it could become cost prohibitive depending on what you need to relocate. I mean, right. if there's wires that need to be relocated, or you know, even building codes could could become somewhat prohibitive on these types of things. Where I just want to put a little apartment above my garage but well, I mean right. got to run water sewer you have to have everything. water sewer yeah, you know I, utilities yeah, and for example would yeah. be a triard and you're impacting everybody else because that right. pole is accessible right there so right. I won't be having one but so yeah so it's um it's probably not for everybody but uh, we at least wanted to be to stay competitive and you know current within our zoning we wanted to at least make an offering within our within our code um to kind of echo that lot size would we be able to curtail the size lot that we would these on? You could. Um, in the in our uh, situation here, I think uh, you know it comes up a little later. I think in a few slides down the road here, we have uh, we have the the criteria for accessory dwelling units and you know the setback requirements, the lot coverage requirements. So the way we have it structured right now is that they would be um, allowed as limited uses across all of our residential zoning districts as well as some of those commercial zoning districts um, with lot coverage. You know requirements applicable to not only the principal building but to the uh, inclusive of the ADU um, setbacks um, so there are there would be control over there's I also, guess the where it can go on the property and there's also a um, we, we would also be introducing a size limit on how large the accessory dwelling unit could be so I think the limit is only about 650 square feet it's like a small apartment it, yeah, basically, or yeah. or a certain percentage of the principal dwelling unit so you know there's a size restriction on them. And I think typically the type of people who live in accessory dwelling units, I think often you'll see like, um, you know, like in-laws, gra like grandparents who want to live close to the, be close with the family, uh, but they aren't maybe able to live independently anymore. That's a common, common thing in accessory dwelling units. So they often will have fewer vehicles and stuff than they're living in a very small unit. They're un less is likely to, you know, have some of those same problems with density over density of a space then you know maybe somebody who would be living in a single family house you know not like you're adding another single family house there it's a smaller apartment so there might be a little bit different impacts on the community than you know adding a full another house just something to consider as well yep. um mr chair i have a couple more questions on this so an adu requires a bathroom yeah. okay do we limit the number of i mean bedrooms they're mostly going to be like studios i would assume right are we going to put a limit on the number of heads that can be sleeping in there every night and is there any way to manage that i mean i, I would have to look at maybe some other i don't think i don't know that you can i mean i think we're just it's, if you have a 650 square foot you know like say the one example on top or you know either one of those i mean it's i don't know how many people you can 
Well, that's the Overly question. What's what doesn't the state yeah. doesn't isn't <laughs> yeah. our state law on how many people can be residing based on the square footage? If I remember, it was very generous, though. I mean, as far as allowing a lot of people five unrelated or something like that. I yeah. think yeah. Well, you know, yeah. I'm and yeah. um, and the parking thing. I'm kind of like this on it. Yeah. I think a lot of us have dealt with people that don't have enough parking in their neighborhoods, but when you look in their garage, there's not a single car, and they have a three-car garage with no cars in it. You know, <laughs> so. So we are, in fact, providing overnight parking for 30 cents a night or whatever parking permit costs, you know, for on street. Does this qualify as a second address as far as getting more parking permits? Uh, that's something we'd have to, I guess, work with building inspections on, but there would likely be, yeah, there would have to be a des special designation for the property for emergency services to identify that this is a separate because living the police, unit. Because the police, I, I, I don't address. know that we'd want to be start start handing out, oh, that, that's a new address, so they're entitled to whatever is a two or three more overnight parking, three new parking permits right. per per or ADU. That, calling in for a month or. Yeah, whatever, whatever that, I think we need to take a look at that. I'm in favor of it. I've stayed in these ADUs, you know, Airbnbs, they turn into that quite often. I've stayed in a couple of that's those. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. This, that's what it's going to encourage, Airbnbs and yeah. verbals. Yeah, um, and that's fine. I don't. I, I don't have a problem. As long with that. as as long as they're inspected and regulated, yep. follow the I rules. Have no problem with we had we had in my district somebody who converted their garage in an ADU without doing it, and building inspector got on them. I'm not sure where that stands right now because that was actually rather recent. But I don't know that they put a bathroom in. I think they just had, they just insulated the upper. They, they insulated the upper in a garage, and then they put some beds in there because the neighbors reported there were lights were on there. All the time. <laughs> oh, that's not a, that's not an ADU. That's just residing in a garage. Yeah, yeah, that's, just you know. living in an yeah that's a good point too. That there's there's people can probably do approximations of ADUs right now. Yeah. The difference is that you know it has to have the facilities of a you you know what would be considered a yeah. dwelling unit. So it has, it has to, to have, have heat. The, has to have, yes. yeah, it has to have so heat. heat pitch, you know, it's not required to have air conditioning. No, uh, well, no, AC, no. I don't believe. But, but you would have to have a bathroom at least yes. to require a kitchen? Uh, I don't know if it does a full kitchen necessarily. There might be some sort of... Whatever, I would say whatever like a studio apartment would require, would, I would imagine be the minimum. So it's going to have to meet, because you're basically in this you know, lower case, you're converting a, a storage garage or a, yeah. you know, to a habitable upper unit there. So it's going to have to meet minimum standards of you know, an apartment yeah. you know, like for building code purposes. Yeah. I'm in favor in this in the general concept. I like the idea of some sort of plan review as far as fitting with the architecture of the existing building, so we don't have somebody putting up like metal siding in a yeah. next to a brick colonial or something like that. So, um, and then one more question: Do we know does this count as net new construction for the levy limit? And you guys probably don't know well, that for the levy. Do, no. Does this count as net new construction? Do you know, Patrick? Your assessor. I know what you're talking about, but yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Value gain it's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> if you convert a garage to a two-bedroom yeah. apartment. If they pull a building permit, then it's fair game for them to be revalued. Well, I'm not talking about raising, I mean, I'm not talking about just raising the taxes on the property owner. I'm talking about for, levy limit. for the levy limit. The levy limits. The levy limit. Net new growth. Is it net, net new growth? Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, that's one of the things, one of our challenges for financing. <laughs> Well, what finance happened, director has a worksheet that he has to fill out for the state department of revenue and it's whatever he puts on the worksheet <laughs> and so if he can honestly identify uh, that as additional construction in that worksheet i think the answer is yes yeah. i'm, I'm, I'm going to go through what you say mm -hmm. he's an attorney mm -hmm. <laughs> must be true yeah, yeah. okay thank you uh, okay where do yep. tiny houses fit under ADU? Um, I think they would. Th they would if they're an accessory to the principal unit. So you couldn't just have a blank lot and build, you know, a tiny, tiny home houses. necessarily. Um, I mean, uh, within our code, it's possible, I, I believe. But yeah. that's not. It, it would be like a secondary. You could basically move in a tiny home onto the back of your property as long as it meets the, you know, requirements that we have, you know, design-wise and size-wise and everything. I don't know how that would work with, like if the tiny home, or if the, might have plumbing, if the ADU, so to speak, is a, uh, is a trailer, like it was on wheels. I don't know that that would qualify in this case. Yeah, I guess because it needs plumbing, correct? Yeah, well it needs, yeah, it needs a plumbing hookup, and I believe it has to be anchored to the ground. Um, well, you can plumb something on wheels, and yeah, sure. yep. you have the they hookup, do it all the time. So. Yep. Yep. 
yeah. every trailer park. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, but maybe that would come into play with some of the requirements. We can, we can maybe flush that out a little bit to see how that works. If it's on wheels versus uh, yeah, we don't we don't want people just parking a trailer in their backyard, yeah. plumbing it in and calling it an ADU. Right. So it has to be like structured. Right. Well. Requiring a building permit, requiring yeah. Well, I mean, might get people put parking school buses and yeah. you know, living out of them. Or <laughs> and take, put it up on blocks, take the yeah. wheels off of yeah, it. Right. Could even take <laughs> the engine out of it. Yeah, yeah that, that could be a good um, right. condition we can or a limitation we can add that it has to be you know structured. We can talk with our. You know, foundation. It has to have a foundation. Yeah. Yeah. We can talk with our you know footings attorneys. And footing, foot, either we've slab been, on grade or footing and footings and foundation. We've been working real close with Kale, uh, city attorney on on this whole ordinance. So I mean that's a good good question we can. We can raise with kale. So I guess before we move on, in favor of proceeding with ADUs versus, you know, raise your hand if you're in favor of it. Yeah. Yeah, with restrictions. With restrictions. Okay. Okay. Snatching the property. Yep. uh, Structure can't be moved. Obviously has to adhere to the building guidelines and setbacks on rear side front lots etc you want to say it requires a bathroom and a separate sink yeah. which would help is, to find is there a any kitchen special requirements of building a place over the top of a garage uh, i would think um I you know because it, of the fire wise with gasoline and a motor yeah, vehicle down proper, there proper proper separations you know fire separations and then you know a, i think our building code would address that building code would definitely okay. come into play there yeah. um just like in a mixed use building yeah And then home occupations, um, uh, current a current topic, right, for everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, it's been obviously the you know the first slide here, just sort of the the trend is that it's growing. You know, it's a big industry. You know, nationally, uh, 500 billion annually, um, a lot run by you know uh, mm-hmm. uh, by women. Um, and historically, it's been a part of our not only our city, but I guess you know nationally, it's been a it's been a it's been something that's been around for some time. So it's not really a new phenomenon. I think it's been sort of uh, nudged a bit and, you know, woke up again, I guess, with with not only, you know, COVID, but uh, just new ways of uh, doing things, entrepreneurial spirit uh, about. So um, we'd like to um, uh, encourage it within our city, but, you know, there are limits and you have to be careful. Um, There's a balance, right? So there's certain uses that we are going to be proposing. Um, We'll show you where, where we're at right now and then we'll show you what we're proposing. So there's going to be permitted uses, but then there's also going to be standards that are um, in play too. And the, the two, we think, have to go kind of hand in hand. So that you know you have a certain list of allowable uses, and then uh, standards that go along with those. And together, I think they work out pretty well. Um, so on the um, on the left, this is our existing zoning code, section 1217 of the zoning uh, that allows for the, the these are the exact list of all the uses that are allowed now in the home occupancy section. Um, all are, uh, you know, for the most part, low, uh, low intensity, you know, not very uh, wild uses. Uh, but, you know, there's that last bullet point that says other similar occupations with the approval of the city. So that, it gets, you know, there's some interpretation there that's introduced. And, um, you know, even with, um, you know, uh, with the list above, I mean, there's interpretations of what home crafts can be or music lessons and so on. But so we've, and the standards on the right, these are currently within our code as well. So if you pass, I guess, that first column, uh, then you need to prove that you pass the second column, which are the standards that are, you know, are you a single or two family dwelling or a condominium? Um, how much of the floor area is going to be used for the business? We, you can't have 100%. It's got to be, you know, a small percentage. Who looks at that? What's that? Well, we don't go out and look. See, that's the thing with home occupancies. The building inspections department, um, there's an occupancy, you know, BP Logics is the way to apply for it. We review it, um, and then if we approve it, you know, building inspection is not going to the site to say, oh, let me sh- show me your office and show me the dimensions. We just, we take what they give us in the application, and if it passes the uses and the standards, it's approved. Um, if we have a question about is this a if there's maybe some twist like a, a a certain type of use that's maybe a tweener like a home craft that might have some possibility of 
creating a, a nuisance, so to speak, or some kind of concern, we'll often share it with our health department or building inspections department just to see what they what they know about the property, perhaps the uh, uh, the occupant, um, any concerns on the on the actual use, if it's going to trigger some kind of different building code. But you'll notice too on the on the right. Um, Usually there, there shouldn't, with these home occupancies, there shouldn't be any interior or exterior alterations. So you shouldn't be, as part of that home occupancy, you know, taking out a bedroom and expanding your, your kitchen, you know, to do your home baking. Um, so, but... Shouldn't, but we don't know. Shouldn't, but we don't know. And, you know, certainly someone could, would need to technically apply for a permit if you are, you know, expanding from a, you know, you're changing your bedroom to a kitchen. It does trigger permits if they apply. So, but yeah. Steve, uh, in, in reference of uh, you know changing uh, of the zoning, which I am 100% in favor, how in the world a few years ago uh, between 55th and 56th uh, between Lincoln and and uh, uh, Hayes, the uh, somebody applied for a permit to put a garage. The garage it turned out to be higher, just about where the house stands. I mean, uh, the garage should be lower, yeah. but it, that's in it's almost the same height. Right. You build a commercial, really, garage, all big over doors, you know, and yeah. you know, with another garage, which to me was not within the zone. It was was really totally illegal. We'll, we'll, we'll actually get to that yeah. later on in our structure oh, section. Yeah. We have some, we'll, we'll talk about some that's, other structures. That's coming, up, coming okay. up next. Yep. Uh, Steve. Chair? Yep. Um, Steve. Yep. I'm just going to base the, the uh, permitted occupations. I'll give you an example. And this is the one thing that I brought up about if somebody's doing hair cutting services. I can tell you they're not just pulling you up to the kitchen table and using their kitchen sink. They're full on clearing out a space. They're putting plumbing a sink in that you can adequately do shampoos, chemical services, other things that if you would come into a regular business, you need venting, you need, you need all this criteria to be met. So that was one of my concerns is even if the state is allowing under that specific licensure that you can do that out of your home, that people are just doing that because, okay, the state said they can, but they're not aware that, hey, you have to do this, the public advertising of it. And it's not just, okay, we're making cookies in the kitchen and selling them, or crafting and doing bake sales, or you know, kind of have that desire. It's full on businesses that are being operated from homes. That's my concern. And I wouldn't um, say it's to knock the entrepreneurial spirit. We want people to open businesses. Yeah. But we have to have, I think, very concise categories. And that other singular occupations with approval really just gives you so much variance to that. Yeah. So if you, if you meet that list, you yeah. can do it. If you don't, you don't. So we're, what we're proposing, um, at least there's a few options here too, but what we're proposing um, in the ordinance is on the left. And so we went from that long list that you saw on the previous slide of permitted uses to, you know, a consolidated list. So it's shorter, we uh, simplified it to art studios, there's the dental labs, that's the non-patient type of use. So it's not a dentist office, it's a, they make dentures or crowns or something like that. And uh, family child care homes, um, home baking crafts, instructional training. We've just put in there eight or fewer people. Um, so for instance, like music lessons or computer lessons, I don't know, whatever someone wanted, wanted to teach a small group of people. Um, and then office. So that's, that's what we've boiled it down to. So you're, if you fit that permitted use category, there would also be the same standards in play uh, that we had talked about previously on the, you know, within our current code. So together we feel that you know, this, is, this is fair. Um, another option which was uh, recently uh, mentioned, um, uh, in, uh, introduced to us was uh, maybe taking a look at perhaps an impact-based option, and that would be, you know, there's a perhaps an, a, a short list of no impact uses, and then a short list of low impact uses. So, for instance, in terms of no impact, you know, if you don't know your neighbor is actually doing, working from home or doing a home business, that's probably the best way to 
you know, explain it. Um, but maybe some examples of that would be a home office or internet sales or website design, for instance. You don't really have people coming over to the house um, for a service. You, you can do this. Uh, you're working for a, a company, maybe an insurance agency, and you can do all your work from home. And for whatever reason, you want to apply for a home, home-based home business and or if you have an LLC or something like that for insur- for uh, tax purposes, you, you probably want a home occupancy permit. Uh, low impact uses example, um, these are just hypotheticals like dog groomers, tax accountants, attorneys. Um, and there would also be then a set of rules like what's in the code right now that would govern those low impact uses. Um, and then we would have, you know, on the bottom, that's just the accessory use where you have the zoning districts across the top, and then we have the no impact would be permitted by right, and then the low impact uses would be limited uses where they're allowed, but you need to meet these standards. So that's what we're, that's option A and B, and then option, what's the next? Oh, so I, I guess there are only two options that, that we're pitching here, but um, so I guess just for discussion purposes, um, I don't know if you're in favor of just use-based standards um, and just focusing on here's the list and here's the standards or if you want to get into here's a no impact list of uses here's a low impact list of uses with standards Um, and then we could talk about in any of these options we can talk about the you know if you think our list of of uses is too basic if you want to expand upon it to introduce other ideas like animal grooming pet sitters massage therapy car cleaning hair beauty um, should certain uses need a permit at all? Um, you know, like a home office, do we do we want to be issuing a permit for someone that's purely just, you know? My my concern, Steve, is like internet sales. Yeah. Um, if you're selling out of your house, you're storing things in your house. You're getting deliveries to and from, yeah. and shipping from your house. Or is is the incoming traffic and outgoing traffic with whether it's UPS or FedEx or whatever, is that going to be upsetting to the neighbors? I mean, if you have um, UPS stops once a day, that's not a big deal. But if you've got UPS stopping and Amazon stopping and FedEx and DHL and everybody else, yeah, that's, yeah. that can be irritating, I can see, yeah. on a regular basis. I mean, everybody gets deliveries. But, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's the hard part. It's like, how do you quantify what's what's uh, acceptable and not acceptable? And one whole the tipping for, point. One is the garage today. packed full yeah. of packages, right. and what yeah. can you sell? I mean, right. there's, there's, I'll tell you right, there's a guy in the 4th District that sells guns. He has ammunition and guns. And Well, with that we can't regulate it. We can't regulate it. Yeah. <laughs> what about fireworks? But it's irritating to his neighbors. <laughs> yeah. you know. Mr. Chair, um, I get that with the deliveries, but I, I guess that's no different than... A shopaholic. I got a neighbor across the street that Amazon and UPS is there once, bare minimum, twice a day. They're not running a business. I think she just really likes to shop. But um, if it's limited use, it wouldn't go in front of the council, right? We would say, you have to do this. These are the guidelines. You're good to go. Only conditional is would have to go in front of the common council yes, for a review that's correct yeah the limited use it's it's if it meets the conditions that we have specifically outlined in the code then it's a permitted use that's how the limited use functions then it, it functions as, it's governed like a permitted use after that point once it passes those conditions what's preventing someone from getting a delivery with uh, ltl freight line I don't think that we, I don't think anything. I mean, no, nothing. You might get furniture delivered in a yeah. big truck. I mean, well, and and which is no problem, we, but if you're. Everything should be limited. If you're doing it on a regular outline. basis, I mean, I can see where that would be irritating. Yeah. And so, and so if, I guess if you go back, if you go back like to if that. you're doing a dog okay. sitter, Can you go back to the permit? If someone's watching their neighbor's dog for a fee or they're watching eight dogs that are barking in oh, a yeah, backyard. That's different, yeah. <laughs> um, it's different than, you know, a dog walker bringing a dog over or a pet sitter yep. even for the day having two even dogs or eight dogs. Yeah. Um, same like music lessons. I mean, do you want eight kids playing a trumpet and figuring it out <laughs> next door? Mm, I don't know. Do we limit that to, yeah. you know, three per <laughs> session? One, right. <laughs> one, is, one is enough. <laughs> and, and Mr. Chair, if I may add, now, when we look at these home occupations that we may want to include or not include. And every one of them, with the exception of car cleaning, 
really would have oversight, uh, and pet stores, of course, would have oversight of a health department. Um, there's criteria and that. That was the thing that I was talking about. If I open up a business in West Dallas, I have to sign off in five departments. Um, if you're doing that in a home, that should be, somebody should be seeing what's happening within those walls. And if you're looking at animal grooming, we can say it can go to, oh, well, I cut a couple dogs hair a week or whatever the case is. We're talking my business, if I'm cutting hair and I'm doing a home operating business, I'm going to do it the same as if I have a brick and mortar. I'm going to go one after the other for eight hours in that day mm -hmm. and do my neighbors want one after the other on the half hour to the hour. Same thing with dog groomers. And we're, we're, we have to really look at the totality of it. These aren't just businesses that say, hey, just come on over to the house. I'm going to you know, trim up your dog or do the toenails. Um, they're actually running businesses. That, that's my concern. And no neighbor wants to deal with that traffic constantly okay. and the lack of oversight. I think that that really matters. Okay. If you have the health department coming into a dog grooming shop, why are we allowing it in the home and not having that oversight? So, so what I'm hearing is if we can, with some of these more intensive home occupations, if we could have building, ins we can talk with building inspections and see if this is feasible and you know what their kind of thoughts are on this as well. But if there's kind of higher intensity home occupations, maybe considering having some inspections at those, um, you know, just like our, I guess our business occupancy permits are process like that is what you're thinking. Right, like a no impact. I don't think someone who just sits at home doesn't get a lot of deliveries. I, I wouldn't think a permit is really, you know, no one's knowing, like to your point, you could drive by, you could have a neighbor next door. You really don't know. Yeah. Um, so I like the idea of, no impact and then low impact and then adding on to low impact specifications of you know if it's required to Suzette's point in a building then it should be required in your home my personal thought on it I wouldn't be against it someone you know mm -hmm. having a massage therapy place next door or things like that but it would just have to be regulated because well massage therapy doesn't do good in brick and mortar and now you put it in your home but um, yeah, that's worse. <laughs> you know, I like to say that the I state, know, the state you. with the, uh, <laughs> <I know. laughs> the, the state with the uh, hairdressers and uh, barbershop and all that. Years ago, they used to have a an, an inspector used to come around right. to check all the permits, all the business, and say which dollars throughout the state. But now they they never come around for less over twenty years. They okay. seize that. See, so so to me. You know, talking about, I, I, I agree, uh, all the person Christian about the, uh, some of the people cutting hair at home. But I'll say this, that's pretty hard, really, for somebody, really the city of building inspection, to oversee that, to control that. You know, you have to have an amount of, of transit or traffic, really, to see that it's a big business. But when somebody's got four or five people, say, showing up, a woman or a guy to get their hair done, in a in a the address that's pretty hard to control. So uh, we, we can we can report back to you guys. I guess too. Yeah, we can I mean, we can I mean, we can, could, we can be, talk to building inspections and see what their thoughts yeah, are that's about fine. doing I mean, that's, occupation inspections. It's not the right thing to do, but a lot of people do that. You know, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Alderman yeah. Wrote, yeah. I think yeah. 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 Sticking with Alderman Grisham's point of view with the dog grooming, you could be doing a lot of dogs and then drop them off in the morning and then they're out in the backyard until five o'clock when the owners come and get them. So. You have to be yeah, careful and, there and too. Some do that. You know, most grooming shops they don't board mm -hmm. the dogs during the day. They go one by one, mm -hmm. and then you come pick up your dog. But that's just the the example of what the full traffic would be. Mm -hmm. So it's the same when you go to a barber shop. One's <coughs> in the chair, one's outside waiting, and it's going to be that transition yeah. all day long. But yes, there right. could be some. I can't get mine till six o'clock. That would I, say okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. you're going shopping for three hours. Don't worry, I'll keep feeding I know. you in and the backyard. And also, you got four dogs in the backyard, yeah. and they're all after the same squirrel I, I or whatever. <laughs> he, he, uh, I could say just on that, you don't keep the dogs if you're a dog groomer in the backyard where they can get dirty after they've just been groomed. <laughs> Usually you keep them inside. <laughs> that, that's how that goes. Mr. Chair. So on the permits and inspections. Yeah. Annual inspections? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, they, a, that's a good point. That'd be something we'd want yeah, to bring right. up. And the, the permit fee should cover the cost of the inspection. Yep, absolutely. And so if, the, if we're sending in somebody from bins and we're sending in somebody from fire and we're sending in somebody in from health, I got to figure that's at least $100. And it's oh, got yeah. to be a 35 bucks to throw to get a body in there, yep. right? A professional Easy. in there for a half hour on a scheduled yeah, time or something like that. Point. So I want to make sure this, yep. that, that, that we're recovering our costs here. And to Alderperson Gresham's point, you know, on the hair washing thing, I mean, I imagine they keep detailed. No, oh, you know what? I'm just going to cut hair. Or we'll stay in the dog room. I'm going to stay in the dog room. Well, business is good, and I was doing them in my bathtub. Well, now I converted that into, like, a little, nice you know. Bedroom, yeah, and, you know, I, I tiled out this thing here now. And, you know, it's more like a, like a little doggy shower. So I, I imagine the inspections would stay on top of that to make sure that that's all Yeah, I, I think we have to – I'm going to run this past inspections, too, because I don't want to – Overburden put, put them out there on yes. an annual basis if yeah. they if they're not prepared to do so. So it, you know, I guess I'd like to see I li yeah. I'd like to see it on an annual basis. Yeah. What, where do we draw the line on what kind of business you can have in your house? Because I remember that was, Ed, was Ed Lazinski talking about his, one of his neighbors has a runs like a printing shop in his basement, mm. and he's got trucks coming to deliver paper he's got ups coming to pick up the packages every day yeah, multiple times that, yeah. um mm -hmm. so i mean yeah and i was i was just going to ask you you guys that for your kind of guidance on this too like so we have this list of our six kind of categories right now and option a on the right that's what we have currently uh do how would you feel about including i mean some of these other uses that we have here listed there do we want to expand it more than what we have currently or do we want to kind of keep it as it is? How, how, what kind of direction do you want to go with that? I keep it as it is, personally. Yeah, I don't want to. And then Unless you I, included maybe have some If they spot, applied for it, could it go in front of the council? Or are we running into issues with that? Because, no. I mean, to yeah, like could. some of the impact, the feedback we got, a house in between a bar yeah. that has a pet groomer or a massage therapy with more people coming and going isn't as big of a deal if it's someone that's smack dab in the middle of a residential neighborhood, which is a really good point. Um, so could it be, so then with those, if they're not included into that six, would they apply for a conditional use so, and this is something in home permit? And then it would go in front of the council and we could dive more into well, where do you live, what are you doing, well, what are the conditions? Well, I want to bring that before the council every time. Well, that's we could do, th there are other options though too, in that we could, um, change we could we could think of this as there's three kind of three categories of home occupations there's like the no impact ones like the offices which we could say are permitted yep. with you don't even need a permit you can just do that right. then we could have the low impact ones which are mostly these which you would need a permit and you know potentially if we you know talking to bins maybe they would have some sort of inspection or something mm -hmm. and then there could be high impact home occupancies like the dog grooming or pet sitters or whatever and we would limit those to only commercial districts. So they could only be in the um, C2, C3, C4 if you're at home in those districts. Oh, we could, we could okay. think about it that way. That makes more sense. And then it, and then it exactly. wouldn't have to go to council. <laughs> it wouldn't have to go to council and it would kind of stay in those yeah, commercial areas. I don't even know if uh, for the low impact, if we just leave those six of an art studio, a home baking, I don't even know if inspection would be needed on that. Okay. I think inspection would more so be needed on the high impact. Then you'd be surprised when you talk art studio. So um, it my could neighbor did welding on. Uh, yeah, that's kiln. art. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it is. Kiln. It, yeah, yeah. Um, going back to what you said, Dana, about you don't think it would be an impact if you're like I'll take 70th and 71st and National. You got bronze. You got the house. You've got uh, the health, health department. Mm -hmm. You've got my business down the way. If there's another business that opens up in a house, for example, it does impact parking and other things for those businesses as well, mm -hmm. where we're already fighting for parking. So you do have to think about and, such and things. And we could, well, that's we could, it would be high impact still, but as a resident, the point of this is in home that it doesn't disturb the layout of the neighborhood. Having a few extra cars really. Is it going to be a burden? Yeah. Would it be more of a pain? Yeah. But is it going to impact? Right. What's I agree with that as far as no, a resident. It's, not. it's already a and, and so one thing, too, is we could keep the same standards we have for all of these home occupations. And one of the standards right now is that it can't have any off-street parking. They have to. Like, if there is 
you know, of client or something coming to the site, they have to be able to park on the lot, so on somebody's driveway or something. That's a restriction we have right now. So that something like that could still apply to the, those that in commercial districts too. Can of worms, though. How could you operate a nail salon, a hair salon, or anything like that and expect nobody to park on the street? Right. You have to have a driveway. Well, yeah. this is right. this is yeah, right. just for a home, just for the yeah, just for the home occupation. Right. But what I'm saying is, we're going to give out this use, and it's not going to be abided by. Not, you're right. It's you're, probably it's not. not. No, it's you're not. A yeah, of the whole first district. I mean, it's, exactly. it's anywhere nice there's alleys. It's going to be probably. It's, yeah, yeah, it's nice to have. Yeah, it's, it's nice to have it in writing. Got the but permit, illegal. Boom. Nobody's yeah. going to come and look again. Mr. Chair. Um, um, others to go back to where others similar as decided by the city. Oh yeah. Okay. So, approval of the city. Who is that? Yeah, it's the uh, zoning. It's Plus. planning and zoning. Okay. Yeah. So. And so, is there an appeals process for that? If if you guys say no, is there a way that a citizen could they, have be they heard could, by? Yeah, they the, go to the board of review. Uh, so they, they can go to the board of appeals. Yeah. That's yeah. the board of appeal. Yeah. 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 Appeals. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that if an individual on your staff makes a decision that a citizen is not happy with. Right. They still can be heard. I'm not. I'm not trying to say make a bunch of work for somebody else, but I just want to make sure there's an appeals right. process. Okay. I think. So yeah, look at no impact, low impact, high impact. Have those stipulations. And again, I mean, I guess annual inspection, I, annual permit impacts on our staffing. Yeah. I think that's that's, that's the big question. We can talk to Bins question. about that, and then we'll also just look into how could we do this in the commercial districts with those higher impact ones, where they would have basically they have a client coming. That's kind of when it becomes a higher impact, I think. Well, so you know, what what are we trying to do with this? You're not trying to encourage people to run a business out of their home. You're trying to accommodate people that have the need to have a small office or something in their home and do, and do a business. If I want to go to a barber, I'm going to go to a barber that's got a commercial shop that I know is, I can see everything, it's clean, I know how it's operated. I'm not going to, to go to some business that somebody's doing out of their house. And, and I agree with that because I think we're, that what we're doing is we're encouraging those people mm -hmm. to do yeah. business. Out I want, I, we got a lot of empty storefronts, so let's fill them up. Right. You know. <laughs> so okay. I wouldn't really even look at that high impact okay. in the category that you I, I wouldn't even consider So we'll that. take a little, we'll, we'll take a measure of the room then. So how many people would be in favor, I guess, of going forward with the kind of no impact, low impact, and not doing those kind of more higher impact where some client huh, might be me. there? So that's option B is what you're saying, right? right. Yeah, option yeah, B, B essentially, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And then would some people be in favor of the high, allowing some of those higher impact in commercial areas? In commercial areas, yeah. In okay. commercial areas. Okay. I wish I think that's a way to go, but yeah. okay. commercial So we have a kind of a, a little bit of what a... I was voting on. I thought I was voting on option A or option oh, B. Oh, I see. What are, you, what, are, what are we voting so on? Our, <laughs> good, good, yeah, good call. We've kind of adjusted a little bit. So I guess it's option, option B is kind of what we're looking at. Not that B. That B? Yeah, I guess kind of this is what the basis is, essentially. And then would we also allow, would we do B or B plus the higher impact in the commercial areas? In commercial? I don't have a problem in the commercial. In commercial, only yes. Commercial. Only in residential, no. Okay. In commercial, I have no problem. Inspection. With inspections. And yeah. obviously other limitations. I mean, I still think that we need to state of a pet sitter, even though it's high impact, that there's still regulations on it that it's not pet sitting for eight. You know, if it's in commercial, it's mm -hmm. pet sitting for this limit. And we set certain limits okay okay would the would the dog thing fall under the same regulation with three and with a fancier's license or fancier um it's a three or five and they don't own it four is the next over is it four is it, it four, four? Yeah. if you have yeah if you have more than two you need a fancier fancier's and you can go to four max go up to four max unless there's puppies under a certain age uh, yeah right five months and yeah but a groomer that wouldn't count because the, the fancier people. only counts for ownership Oh, okay. So going back to the high impact in commercial, then we have, as our Alderman Wickel said, um, excuse me, a review once a year in home and inspection. five depart inspection, yeah. inspection, and that would be like if you're what we would do business. if we open up a business. <laughs> yeah, right. We will t we'll talk to Bins about that to see if it's feasible for them. We can kind of 
we can kind of draft a yes we can draft a plan for this and talk to bins and give you guys an update and kind of out out, a a new outline of what our proposal for this will be what what we can kind of do that specifically yeah i guess it'd be nice to know what the impact would be i mean i'm sure you must have a list someplace and uh, of all the occupancy permits that are out there and what category they would fall in now and bins would have to come up with an idea of how many they do a year and what it costs them Health would also, fire would also, yep. you know, so that they, what it costs to get our, our staff in there. I don't know that, well, I guess we, we're not going to let, we're going to make fire come every year. Mr. Chair, yeah. fire comes every year. Mm-hmm. Um, what, it, I know it said that, like, <clears throat> low impact is non-nuisance, noise. What if a neighbor complains? Is bins review it? Is it up for review yearly? You then do those, we keep those on file, and then when they go to reapply, we say, "Listen, we had everyone on your block complaining that dogs were barking, or that you're getting 32 shipments in and out a day, and you're taking up parking spots, and you're doing this. Yeah. How would that work?" So, I mean, so there's an allegation, right? Somebody's complaining about uh, a nuisance, potentially nuisance home occupancy I mean that it's going to take staff time to go out and investigate that I mean we can we can send a a notice uh, notice an order to to stop but I mean based on what so we I think we have to sort of go out there and there was that incident I think in the fourth district uh, some years ago someone was selling fire sticks or something you know some kind of electronic device or something out of there and there was an allegation of cars night and day showing up at this place to to purchase this and then and then leave and I think there was some truth to it, but then I think there was some exaggeration, exaggeration. Like fluff I mean. to the, so to the argument. Yeah. It's a neighborhood feud. It, yeah. They just didn't like, like each other. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it obviously has to be legit. I don't want to right. just pull someone because Nancy up the block, right. you know, yeah. that's, yeah, Karen up the block has, <laughs> a, has that's, a problem with yeah. everything, but you also want to take into consider, you know, but we also have to somewhat acknowledge it because... Yeah, the hard the hard part is like just going out there and just trying to observe what what the neighbor or what the people that are concerned about it are are seeing and trying trying to capture that and then somehow prove that oh yes these people that are parking here are, are legitimately walking into this place to purchase you know goods and then they're leaving and this is happening three times a an hour you know throughout the day um, so it it takes staff time and. Couldn't we also, I, I know health has to get in there, fire has to get in there, inspection has to get in there. Couldn't one guy just do it, one person do that? Like, well, it's what they're trying to do in, with like cross train yeah, or whatever right. the word is, like a fireman would yep. know. Yeah. That's what the city of they, Milwaukee has done for years. They would be able it's to done by it. neighborhood services. Yes. They just have a questionnaire, or a, not a, 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 a checklist. checklist. Yeah. One checklist that, that one person goes off to cover all five of those inspections. Right. Okay. Then yeah. But that's, that would be yeah. nice to look into. Yeah, that's uh, something for uh, we've worked on for a long time and hasn't happened. Yep. Yeah. Um, What's going on? I want to go back to Gotta hold their the feet to the fire. And, mm-hmm. and I'm just trying to give you guys kind of a knowledge base. When I opened my business, I had to have a state engineer come in and design for vents because of chemicals. Now, and that's just doing a perm, that's doing a color. I could say 95% of my client base was hair cutting. But because I said I was going to do a color or a firm, I had to have that vent system in. <coughs> if we're allowing this in the home and we're looking at that five department sign off, those same things are going to have to meet the standards in a home that they would have to in a business. So to even entertain the thought of that, think <coughs> about how many homes, if, you have, if you're doing hair in a basement or you're doing it in one room, you certainly don't have a vent system because a bathroom vent isn't going to do it. So I think we're opening up a situation that really isn't going to be regulated mm-hmm. in the ways it needs to when you're looking at that specific business. Um, pet groomers, maybe it's a little different because they're not People using People dye their chemicals. pets hair. <laughs> dye their pets hair. I've seen it. Well, <laughs> really? maybe, but if, if you want Fly to around really done you're, for you're, dogs. you're dealing sure. with the same thing, but you're not using... Yeah. Usually, cost of chemicals. Then we you put that in the sign-off that you must that. have this type of venting, and if it's not, then you don't get your business. Yeah. If you can't afford to do the venting, then you don't get your business right. in your home. 
So right. it almost helped to eliminate some of those that think they're going to, if we have, if we know what is all needed on that and it's part of the checklist that gets checked right. and you don't have it, then you don't get to cut Just it. Just a kiln to have to be vented. Well, if I was going to do that, I'd just say, well, I'm not dying anybody, Sarah. I'm just yeah. yeah I'd say it. that. Yeah. You'll say that, but yeah. you wouldn't do that. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I, think, um, uh, I have a question on the home baking. Yeah. I didn't know it was legal to sell. So that's actually, commercial it wasn't, goods. there was actually, a, there was recently a, a new law state passed and we, we were, law. a new state, state law. law. Really? And we were made aware of it. And so, yeah, we, we so have to incorporate that. You don't need a commercial kitchen anymore? Um, I, you don't, you don't need a commercial kitchen, but I think this is really low, low, it's supposed to be low impact, low key. I mean, we're not, uh, we're not talking Carrie's Krispies here, I guess that where you're well, having retail I, customers. I think it's the I mean, product that's not refrigerated products. Is that, is that where the line bake, is drawn? Can yeah. it have like custards in it? Things that require refrigeration? Yeah. I, if I, it's, it's I, very I, just dried, you know, dry, yeah. you know, baked goods. It's cookies. that like cookies, yeah. uh, you know, brownies, those types of things. And once you start getting into, I think more complicated things that spoil, I, yes. I think you cross the line. So, so yeah. I, I, Called the cottage about food line. sanitation yeah. too. Yeah, that's where it comes from. <laughs> yeah, cookies never. No cookie is gonna kill yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife makes cookies. I mean, what's right. what's the problem? She makes pretty good ones too. <laughs> so, so we'll get back to you. Guys. Very we will report ones. back on the home occupation stuff. Give you guys an update <laughs> with a new a newer plan. There's, and we, there's some more information. <laughs> yeah, there's some more info we need and some more kind of you know input you guys can get. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, I was going to say something uh, in reference of uh, some of the uh, small business, like I say, at the uh, hairdressers. You know, I would like to see really the uh, if it was if it would be a percentage. I, I really, how many people are really doing cutting at home? Really, I mean, how can we find out? More than I mean, lot. to me, it'd be kind of hard. I don't want to put more more staff adding more people really to, to find out what because many people they won't open the doors we have to have a warrant mm -hmm. to go inside the well then you don't get a permit well, you don't per, get to run a permit, business so don't open they do it door. anyway I, I think what vince is saying yeah, is that's what i'm saying i mean that are barbers or, or yeah. hairstylists i'll bet you 99 percent of them yeah. do yeah. do work in their home for their friends or Relatives. That's right. See, that's, Vince probably cuts his wife's hair or whatever. I do cut my wife's hair. I, hair. I, hair I, I have a two brother, a cousin. I cut the hair. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't charge them, yeah. but just right. the idea it is. When yeah. you're doing it for. Yeah, I mean, I don't charge, do it for, you know. You know yeah. yeah. But, I can say right. I have. And I think that's. In that's make, that's and the to me, it's a hard yeah. task, really, for the city to kind of uh, work on something like that. You know, it's, it's, it's a little difficult. You're, you're right, Vince. I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy. Difficult, really. <laughs> yeah, it's those not. same people yeah. probably aren't going to apply and go through it all anyway. No, they're, they're not. Just gonna keep they're doing just doing it, it for a couple of friends, and that's it. It's not a business. Yeah. See, see, the state, I mean, uh, you have to get yeah, a license, and, and you kind of, uh, they're the watchdog, like but they don't do anything, really. The state doesn't do anything anymore. They this just is more issue. so, I think, prompted about people posting on Facebook and yes. West Dallas News and Events saying, yes. hey, I got a business. Come get your nails done. Come right. get your hair done. Yep. Come yeah. get this exactly. done. And clearly they are running a business. Yes. Yeah, it's that's right. See, that, that, that's right. your nephew's that hair, way, 100%, hair. Yes. Right, that's the problem. Yes, that's a problem. And you've seen more and more of it, and even to the points where they show pictures and they legit got the chair and the water <laughs> and everything. all the nails on one whole wall. Yeah. So basically like a spare bedroom was turned into mm -hmm. a little nail studio with the lights and the tables and the pedicure things and everything so that's where i think more so this is i do too I do. Towards. You gotta stop that or regulate yeah. it anyway Just to your point we have small businesses we can fill that's where we're going to go with it all right, so switching gears a little bit. Um, this is something that right now, so we're, next up we're going to be talking about housing. Uh, right now we don't have any changes related to housing within the code. We just wanted to get your guidance on, these are some kind of new trends that are, you know, new, new kind of trends that are happening across the country and we want to stay on top of these things. So we are going to kind of give you guys some options for any, some changes in the where housing can be allowed in, in the city. And we're just gonna, gonna gonna run through this quick here. Um, so, a kind of modern zoning best practices to allow more of this what's called missing middle housing. It's kind of 
these kind of mid-size housing things. So it's um, duplexes, maybe three and four unit apartments is really what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, it's often not not legal to build these in large amounts of Amer like America's residential land. So in West Dallas, over half of our land that's zoned for residential uses, you cannot build these. It's basically single family only. Um, and, and there's, you know, been people have started to notice some problems with, you know, single family only districts. Uh, they kind of artificially constrain the housing supply by inflating housing costs, uh, encourages sprawl, discourages density. Um, it can limit the opportunity for property owners for what they can do with their property. Uh, can reinforce kind of economic um, divisions. You know, some areas, you know, people with less money can't get into. Um, and it can prevent building, you know, what some people might see as desirable neighborhoods and building types. Uh, so more um, American cities are kind of turning to this European model where you have you allow a greater mix of housing types in, in more neighborhoods. Uh, and there's some benefits to this, you know, it could be more taxable value, encourages more density, um, having more housing units means that your population can grow more, um, gives more choice in the housing market. So it's kind of a free market kind of approach to this. So what we just wanted to take a look at and get your input on is how these, you know, we wanted to look at how these concepts could work in West Dallas and kind of get the guidance of you guys of which way you'd want to take this. So first off is the no change option. This is just what we have right now. Um, so the missing middle type housing is allowed in our RB and RC districts only, which is in the blue on that graph um, up on the right there. That is where the two, that's where duplexes are allowed. And this, again, is where three and four unit um, apartments are allowed. So it's mostly on the east side of the city and central side of the city. Uh, the, on the bottom, you'll see our zoning table. So one unit dwellings are permitted uses in RA1 and two unit dwellings are limited uses in RA1. This is a very rare limitation. Uh, it only applies to properties that share or basically bordering a commercial property. So it's only uh, a very select few of RA properties are allowed to be duplexes. But essentially, uh, two uh, duplexes and three to four unit um, apartments aren't allowed in, in any of the RA districts is what we're looking at. So the first option is the biggest change. This would just be an extension where we would allow duplexes in all of the zoning, all of the residential zoning districts, including those RA districts. So this map on the right would show where those uh, duplexes could be. Uh, this map would show where the three to four unit um, buildings could be. This would be allowed in RA3 in this option. And it would be allowed in RA2, just similar to how duplexes were allowed before, where it would have to be next to a commercial property. But it would not be allowed in RA1 to keep that kind of you know, neighborhood character the same. Uh, one thing that, you know, from a zoning perspective, the form and function of a duplex and a single unit dwelling are pretty much the same. They look pretty much the same. They function pretty much the same. So that's just why we would allow those in RA1, but not the other, the three to four unit building. So the next, uh, the second option is a little bit less big of a change. This is extending um, the missing middle housing with some limitations. So this would essentially allow them as permitted uses in the RA3 district um, and it would allow duplexes, I should say. And then there would be some specific limitations for duplexes that might be a little bit more than what they are now, um, but could be kind of you know, changed to fit how, however we want to go with it. So it could be, it has to be within, you know, maybe 100 feet of a commercial district. Um, so something maybe a little bit more than we, we currently have, or it could just kind of stay the same. And then we would allow uh, three to four unit dwellings just a little <coughs> bit more in those districts if they're bordering commercial properties. And then the third option is the least kind of, or the smallest change. This would be a partial extension. It would really focus on our RA3 district. Um, the, RA3 district, I'm just going to flip forward, already has a lot of duplexes that are now non-conforming uses. They were probably built before the zoning code was changed. So a lot of the, these neighborhoods kind of already have a mix of single family and, and duplexes. Um, so what we would propose in this third option is to allow duplexes as a permitted use in RA3, um, which would increase that conformance. Um, and we'd also allow a select number of the three to four unit apartments where it, it basically would have to be bordering a commercial property. Um, so in summary, let me go through to here. So there's kind of four ways we could take, um, take this kind of change in housing. We could keep it the same as it is right now where the RA districts are really just single family homes. Uh, we could extend um, the, the two unit dwellings, the duplexes and the kind of small apartments, three to four units. We could extend those pretty large, uh, pretty large extension in option A, 
um, where they'd be permitted, a duplex would be permitted all the way through all of our residential districts. And you'd have some, some a little bit more um, flexibility for those three to four unit apartments, but it wouldn't be allowed in most of our RA1 or RA2. Uh, then there's the RAB, which is a little bit less big of a change that would kind of allow, um, you know, allow those duplexes in RA3, but not much elsewhere. It would be just be kind of a limited, a slight extension. And then option C is the smallest change. It's only would be in RA3, and it would be kind of intended more as a way to promote the conformance of uh, those duplexes. So now that we've kind of summarized these four different options, uh, I guess, what are your thoughts? Do you guys have any questions? And, you know, which way would you guys want to take this? Keep it the same, change it a lot, a little bit. We had problems on the East End mm -hmm. um, years ago, and I don't know if it's still a problem with people converting their single family homes into duplexes. Uh, illegal. This, mm -hmm. It's illegal. Can we make it legal? Should it be legal? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. I, I think I if know. it conforms to the building codes and the standards, yeah, I don't, I don't see any problems so, with it, really. So, they, they apply for I think the, permits. I think the issue is is ownership versus rental. Rentals. Yes. yes. Yeah. And, and Mr. That, Chair. That's, that's, where, that's where it changes. And I think we've talked about this, I don't know if this is a committee or a different committee, about some way of encouraging owner-occupied duplexes. I, don't, I think, as alderman, I think my I don't know how you most of that. my issues with, are with absentee landlords. But when the landlord lives there, and, and I don't know how much of that we have yet, my, my anecdotal evidence is that we're having less owner-occupied, fewer right. fewer owner-occupied duplexes, and most of them, they're, they're moving in that direction. And I, that's a trend I'd like to reverse. I don't think any of these trends, anything here is going to reverse that trend. No, nothing here is going to help that. No. Um, and that's where you get back to the pride of ownership, um, where, you know, people take care of their own homes better i'm not against rentals but i don't know about i certainly would not want to see option a you know just allow duplexes anywhere um i think though if somebody's gonna make the investment in a bigger house i think family sizes on general are shrinking well, i'm thinking I'm condos sure. if somebody wants to build a side-by-side -side, uh, townhouse yeah it's condos what's wrong with that would we allow that now? We allow that. Yeah. As long as it, yeah, I guess it meets the, the bulk you, requirements well, of the second we construction. Right now, if you had side-by-side -side condos on the same lot, you're saying, is that Yep. Yeah. That would not be allowed in most of our RA districts. Considered a duplex. It would be considered a duplex. It would, have to, it would have to be next, immediately next to a commercial property right. for it to okay. do that. But so it would not be allowed right now. Yeah, it's currently allowed in so our RB districts. Yeah, it's right. allowed in the east side. You know, yeah. So the issue is more the owner, yeah. the owner occupancy. It's, is what yes, it's the owner occupancy thing, and certainly the threes and fours are are way less likely to have oh, yeah. an owner there. You know, right. I, I've mentioned this before. My family's start up the ladder, <laughs> started with a duplex on 38th so and Lloyd. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Holy moly! Is that a possum? Is it? Oh. I it was a yeah. dog. Possum. Uh, 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 wow, he's. Take him home. Just cool. like you can cook him up. Don't worry, you can take to the restaurant. Make a nice soup. Yeah, I'm sorry, Dinner time. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. My, my, fam my family's beginning started with a duplex, you know, economic coming here from Germany. They started with a duplex on like 38th and Lloyd. And that was the beginning. Coming back. But eventually it got most, sold. Yeah, yeah most got, of them do. Yeah. 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 I mean, but. So, yeah, I mean, I think our strategic. Uh, plan uh, or vision had called maybe for had an idea of about offering an incentive for sort of incentive owner occupancy. For that. that's a that's a different issue different here. different that's issue different you know issue. a different incentive yeah. but i mean this would be do, do you want to maybe There's increase the intensity of same uh, one he's pacing yeah. Yeah. maybe they like uh, us hey so eh? so yeah. you're interesting steve <laughs> but not as interesting yeah, as this more awesome <laughs> And as far as like converting, you know, on the east side and so on, converting a, a single family to a duplex or vice versa, yeah, it does, it would require a building permit. And in yeah, any of our RB yeah. districts would be yeah. okay as long as you have a permit to do so. Yeah, expensive. it would be expensive. Okay, so the issue was, it wasn't that it wasn't permitted; it was that they weren't getting permits. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Just happening. So, so my question it is, uh, if uh, like all, all the person Wagon mentioned about owner occupy. But I'm sure there is some ruling laws. You know, if the guy he built that or he purchased, have to. I mean, it's been happened. They buy, they live there a couple of years or so. They sell it. Yeah. They sell it. So, 
So there is no laws where he Rent can refrain yeah. 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 anybody no. really from doing that. No, really. you can't. Mm-mm. I mean, there's no laws. No. Really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I think like from a I, from my understanding from a policy way, there's not you can't you know create a law that forces people to live in a no. duplex. Yeah. So you know, if they own it, but so you can I, encourage it by you know incentives or, or give them so a loan based on occupancy. So on the east end, over ninety percent is all rental. I mean, non-owner occupied, really. Over ninety percent. I bet you that's what it is. Never used to be like that, but now it is. I mean. Okay. Uh, so I guess I think I I think we have a good <laughs> sense of the room here. We're just going to go through them and vote, just so we have a clear a clear direction. So all in favor of the no change option, raise your hand. Yeah, it's probably me. No change right now. No change. Uh, option A. I'm actually on the bolder end of this. <laughs> I'm, I'm really in favor of higher density, a free market approach to housing, and as one of the only, if not, renter on the council, I think um, having more housing options would be beneficial to our city. Okay. More money, more people, more business, yep. et cetera. Okay. Option B, and then option C. Okay, two for option C. Yeah. Okay, that's helpful for okay. us to know. We can move on. Tony? All right, oh. so this- <laughs> <laughs> this next change, we're, we're also going to be presenting a few different options for you all. Uh, but we're talking about automotive uses in the C2 district. So the only two automotive uses that are allowed in C2 are fuel sales and motor vehicle service. So there are 25 gas stations within the city of West Dallas and 45 motor vehicle service shops. And just for context, the C2 district, it's intended for a mix of uses in close proximity to residential areas that are compatible with the neighborhood scale. Uh, And currently, fuel sales and motor vehicle service is a conditional use in the C2 district. We've had some neighbors uh, call recently about some uh, gas stations that were going in. that were in opposition based on the noise and fumes and, and lighting that, that gas stations are. So first option, we're, we're gonna start from um, lowest impact to highest impact and go to highest impact. So doing nothing, uh, important to note that uh, gas stations and motor vehicle services heavily use the C2 district uh, locate themselves within the C2 district. So 46% gas stations and 56% motor vehicle service. Option A, we're proposing to not, for, for these uses to not be allowed in C2 if they share a lot line with the residentially zoned property. So that would make 20% of, roughly 20% of these businesses non-conforming. Option B would, uh, it's similar to option A, but with the nuance of uh, they're not allowed if they're separated by an alley. So if we have gas station, alley, home, then it would not be allowed. Uh, and that would make roughly 40% of these businesses non conforming. And then uh, the most impactful option here is to remove these uses from C2 entirely, which would again uh, affect uh, 46% of gas stations and 56% of motor vehicle service. And here's just a summary of all four of the options. So, what was option B again? Could you go back to that slide? <coughs> yeah, that one's a little bit confusing. It's very similar to option A. Mm-hmm except that we're now including all uh, properties that border an alleyway. Or border an alleyway with, with, with residential. residential. So it's, right. it's a kind of a nuanced, it, it's just a slight People tweak. Can't be in an it's alley a slight. And on a residential? Yeah, so, so the difference between A and B is really just a slight tweaking in the language that would change it from, you know, in option A, 20% would be non conforming, and option, option B, 40% would be non conforming. The intent, though, for both of them is. You know, we, considering restricting those uses if they're near residential uses, the idea is just two ways of phrasing it that would impact more of these kind of automotive uses, you know, in one wording than the other. That's you know, the non-conforming is the same as how it has been before, where the 
folks that are doing it now, our grandfathered in, yep. they sell the business, the same business can go in if it's within 12 months yep. of that sale. After 12 months, then it can no longer be right. that yep. business. That's type of and then the new law right. kicks in, right? No, but oh, yeah. then it becomes a conditional use, meaning if somebody else after 12 months wants to open up a gas station there, Excellent. then it comes before can become before our council and our council can say oh yeah you can you can that's with a vote is that, is that what it is that's if we don't change it that's if we don't change it our plan would be to make it a limited use so what that means is it's a little different than a conditional use so a limited use is if it meets that restriction if it's okay if it fits within our rules it's a permitted use if it doesn't fit within the rules it's not permitted at all so then what, what that would be is in you know say a gas station in our C2 district closes down. Two years later, another gas station wants to come in. They realize that you know they come in. We re we notice that it shares a lot line with the residential property. Then that would mean it's not permitted at all. So this would be these are you know possible strategies to limit how much automotive uses can be concentrated in that C2 district and kind of force them to spread out a little bit more. Is that that's the intention behind it? Um, it would they would not be conditional uses in that district anymore but it says c all across there that is a yep. typo well it's <laughs> <laughs> that's i guess it i guess sorry that's not a typo if they i, I misexplained it if they meet the restrictions they would be a conditional use sorry it wouldn't be permitted that's my bad they would be a conditional use they'd still have to go through the same processes that any gas station would have to go through so if it meets it if it meets that restriction it's okay it's allowed as a conditional use if it doesn't meet it then it's not permitted that's how that's how I should have explained it. Can we go to option B? I just wanted to read it again. Mr. Chair, you got to go back. Mr. Chair, yeah, I would. I think our gas stations are so much more than that. They have become the de facto corner store for a lot of people. And I'm not that I'm pro gas station or pro automobile. I mean, I'm not anti automobile necessarily, <laughs> but. The gas station for a lot of people is really good. Gallon. They walk to get a gallon of milk, or they buy their cigs, or you know, not many of them sell bananas or fresh fruit, I guess. But they are, you know, um, yep, milk, they, bread, they sandwich, are, soda, yeah. Yeah. water. And when I think of the auto repair, the auto repair guy, <laughs> the guy I go to, part of the reason I go to him is because I can drop my, I can drop my car off and walk back. He is to me, my auto repair place is a neighborhood business. Hopefully, I don't have to see him that often. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, I think there's a value to that. That that's we're back in that density conversation, mm -hmm. where I can walk to the businesses and services that I need, maybe not weekly or even monthly, but it's it's an important thing to me that I can that I can walk. Clearly, you can buy gas anywhere you want. But if but if the gas station, and how many gas stations today only sell gas? or only even have auto remote auto related stuff i think there's i don't think i can think of any of them that aren't selling <laughs> other stuff right so um I, I guess and honestly i think in 20 years which is i mean we're looking this is all this is a lot of long view stuff right yeah i think in 20 years there's gonna be fewer gas stations oh, absolutely oh. absolutely I'm charging my car at home mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. i bet my car is going to charge <laughs> if I'm still here in 20 years. So, I mean, if we're looking at the long view, which is what this, all of this is about the long view, you know, I, I don't know how important this managing of the, of the, and, and, you know, and I'm gonna go back to the auto repair place, you that's, know. That's a skilled, different story though. There's, yeah, but the auto repair places, at least the ones I go to, there's skilled guys working there, they're not parking the cars on the street. They're not violating all the all the terms of the special. The problems we have are typically they, they have the garage, the the doors open on a. Yeah, they're working. They're we'll working the at first 10 p.m. on a Saturday night, or they're maybe doing stuff they're not supposed to do. Maybe a little body work on the side and all that. That's a matter of enforcement and all that other stuff. But. Well, but it's hard on a lot of those little shops. I mean, they can't be out there no, every day. No, and that's. And, yeah. and in the summertime, it gets hot inside the shops. The guys open the doors. Yeah. Even it's if it's very, says, very I noisy. I know we approve them with, you know, doors got to be closed when they're working. I know. But that's but it never happens. No, never, oh. never happens. So I, I have, I agree with you on, on the service stations, the, the uh, repair shops. I think we, we should 
regulate them. If they're next to a residential, I, I think that should stay that in. Because by definition, but, but again, like I said, and I guess most of them run a shuttle service, right? At least the ones that are connected to dealerships. Oh, yeah, they yeah. are. But I think a lot of little, you know, whether they're mom and pops or whatever you want to call it, I don't think I think I think a lot of our small business owner they don't they don't have a guy sitting around to drive me back home. No, no, mm -hmm. you know so. Uber but they have a car you can borrow okay. typically. Yeah, yeah. Say yeah. Like that little beater a, you can. A beater for the loaner. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had that one time. It was a beater. Right. Hey, Mario, did you have any connections? I mean, uh, I'm gonna give so you a ride what, home. What I mean. Options about A, B, C, and <laughs> so yeah, you can go back to the last bit. And we could we could do this part by part too. We could take it first for fuel sales and then for yeah, um, okay. and then for auto repair. We can do them separately. But uh, Tony, what do you guys recommend? We, I, I'd we like to know that. We don't recommend option C. We don't think we should. And that's just our staff general consensus. Yeah. And you're saying gas and, but I, I think we should break out them entirely. Yeah. Gas stations and repairs separately. Yeah, yeah, we, can, yeah, yeah. we can take we can them separately. That. I think, yeah. For, I think <laughs> Wait, I still want to hear what they yeah, recommend yeah, though, please. I, I would pick um, A or B would be, I guess, the A being the le le less, less intense because it's just if you're a budding residential, uh, B gets a little bit more intensive because in some cases then you have you have the alley as a separator between the commercial and the yeah. residential, but you're only 15 feet away from that auto repair use, for instance. So, Can you think of an example with the alley? Sure. 76th um, and Lincoln. Yeah, 70, like 76th and uh, Lincoln. What have we got here? No, it's gas station, right? Yeah, two gas stations there, the one on the yeah. um, It's pretty southeast common along corner. Lincoln Avenue where there's, yeah. it, it, there's a lot of, there's oh, yeah. the alley the, and then there's a residence there's right a, behind it. Behind the alley. Uh, another one might be like Pope Automotive on 105th and you know Greenfield. Yeah. Um, there's an alley that oh, yeah. separates the. Yep. That might be a situation. Um, so the alley else? one is A then, correct? Uh, that B. B. Oh, that's B. B. Oh, B. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So I do prefer A. Okay. All right. So for fuel sales, we'll go first. Yeah, fuel sales first. All right. So no change to fuel sales. So continue to allow them in C2 unrestricted or just as conditional would, uses. Yep. Yeah. No change. So raise your, I guess raise your hand. Two, two, three, three, four, five, six. six. Is there any that are just automotive gas stations? When I was a kid, I could think of some. Oh, yeah, but I can't anymore. picture any now that what? Me either. A, a gas a gas station that only sells auto related. You might get a fuel filter mm -hmm. there or a gallon or a quart of oil. Yeah. But I think all of them sell something. Joe's right? service at seventy yeah. fifth and National. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but all of them now have Sandwiches or, or soda yeah, they don't or have milk or something. Yep. Just right. auto <laughs> so, so then, so continuing on for fuel sales. This is now fuel sales option A. Yeah. So this is the small restriction where you know if it's across an alley, they could still do it. But if it's just sharing a lot line, then no. So anybody for this one? No. Okay. No. Uh, then option. This is fuel sales again. Option B, including the alley. Anybody? No. Okay. And then C. Uh, for fuel sales, so just completely remove it from C2. Zero, okay. Did, did I must have missed for the, for I guess, I, I don't think, I think we missed one person, but I wasn't sure if they were going to vote again, but okay. Auto repair? Unanimous. I guess. Uh, yeah, can okay. I, can I ask one question? So, like, this gas station on this corner, it abuts an alley and on a residential property. Yeah, there's a lot of them that do that. Yeah. So what you're saying is the alley is behind it? If the alley is the thing that separates, separates them. Oh, residential, yes. Yeah. Not on the side. Uh, on any side. On, 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 on any side. Regardless of, yeah, front, so, rear, I mean, rear side, if whatever. If we were yeah. looking at the new gas station that's going in on 84th yeah. and that house that now is going right. to be coming down, that wouldn't have been permitted if we made that change because right. they're okay. adjacent it's to the lot. Well, that was, I, that was I think that one was zoned commercial, here. though. It's about the zoning at the use, That right? house was yeah. zoned commercial. That yeah. house was yeah. yeah. 84th and Duke. Was it 84th the Greenfield or 84th and That was zoned commercial. 84th and Greenfield. was commercial, too? There's no, it's only one on on lady okay. yeah. So it's then, uh, are we going to do this again? So, uh, auto repair option A. No change. Oh, sorry. Auto repair, no change. Pair was no change? I thought so, we we're voting again. We're voting. Voting again. So, auto repair, no change. Vince? Okay. One. Auto repair option A. Auto repair option B. Two. And auto repair option C. 
makes it easier. Okay. All right, then, Mr. Chair, I have a question after we vote here. Okay, well, I want to pin you guys down because I, I didn't understand your answer before. So there, there's a C after each of those. That means it's a conditional use then under this new proposal. Yes. And a conditional use is the same thing as a, um, a special use currently. Yep. Yep. So by taking this action, turning it into a conditional use means that still we could allow automotive and fuel sales right next to a, um, a zoned residential property um, if we decided to do so as a council because so, that's what we can do currently yeah, under do. a special use so so yeah conditional use and special use they're the same it's just a change in the word but what this is saying is that um, we're going to continue allowing it as a conditional use but it will not be allowed if it is touching that residential property if it shares a lot line with the residential zoned property so if it's conditional and one of the conditions that it has to meet otherwise we won't allow it is that it cannot be sharing a lot line with a residential property so in that sense conditional use is not like it's a, a current condition. special use it's like a, yeah it's like a limited a limited conditional a limited special use a limited conditional use it's kind of an additional it's just one of the conditions that it has to meet in order for we, us to allow it it's, otherwise it's not allowed so with special uses or conditional uses currently I mean, the council does have some flexibility to modify parking requirements or, you know, some bulk requirements, but, but not in the case of let's just use like a tobacco retailer. If we have a thousand foot separator between tobacco retailers or licensed uses, you can't change that number. The thousand foot is a hard number in the zoning code. Yeah. Um, if that if that makes any sense. So that <laughs> yeah. sounded like the other category that you had given us before of. What was it, an L? Uh, yeah, so yeah. the difference is that if the process that they follow afterwards. So if it's a limited use, the limited process use. after it is that it's a permitted use, basically, after it, and we don't have to go to council with it. This is saying that, so what would happen with these gas, with, or with these auto repair shops is they would come in and they would come to us and say, we want to go in this property. And we would say, okay, you meet our zoning, you are you know, not sharing a lot line with residential, now you're gonna go through the conditional use process. You're gonna to have to go to plan commission, you're gonna to have to go to common council. And then if, if the, however, if they come to us and they're like, hey, we wanna go here, and they don't share, or they do share a lot line, sorry, and then we'd be like, no, our zoning says you can't do that, and it'd just be, it'd be dead. Okay. Yeah. That's, how, that's, that's what this one is saying. Yep. Thank you. Yep. All right. I don't know what's next. Oh, structures, Steve. okay, yeah, this is me. Um, thanks. Those are the bulk of our discussion items too. So it's going to be here all night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we'll try to get through this one a little faster. But I mean, this, so this, um, in terms of um, structures, um, these are all of your setbacks. Um, and some of the more significant changes, I guess, within this um, are, you know, first and foremost, within the RA and RB districts, um, we're removing the minimum lot areas. So in the RA, existing up on the very top there above RA1, RA2, RA3, those are the minimum lot areas right now as, as we have in our current zoning ordinance. So 10,000 square feet minimum lot area for RA1 district, Orchard Hills area, for instance. I RA2, RA3 are 7,200 and 6,000 respectively. And then RB, uh, one of our you know very common districts on the east side of the city is minimum lot area of 3,600 square feet. And then when you start getting up in the multifamily zoning districts, there is no minimum lot area um, currently. So what we're doing though um, within this table uh, going from the list form to a table format um, by, by eliminating the minimum lot requirement you're not really we're not really going to be saying that we're shrinking lot sizes or anything like that the setbacks that we have in here and the lot coverage requirements um, lot width especially. oh and, and lot width especially are are controlling that that from really changing much so um, we don't really see the need to have a <coughs> You know, sort of arbitrary or in this case you know what our current um, you know, minimum lots are because the lot with the coverages and the setbacks are going to more or less dictate the size of the lot you have to have you know through those things you're going to get to probably really close to if not right on what those minimum lot areas currently are so we're simplifying it with that respect so in the terms of the height um, within the ra districts really not changing too much within the RA districts. Um, in the RB district, we're going from 35 feet to 40 feet. 
And this is again to support a little bit more, um, in some cases, potentially density roof pitches on the traditional east side of West Dallas. We do have typically, um, you know, some cases smaller lots, and, but in maybe taller homes. Um, so we want to just accommodate, you know, roof pitches, um, you know, additional capacity for, um, you know, whether it be a third floor or just a more, you know, steeper pitched roof um, on a duplex. And then um, also we're introducing uh, maximum lot widths, um, not to exceed certain numbers. So in the case of RA, um, where am I here? Just in terms of uh, the maximum lot width, in the RA district, we don't have a maximum. Um, but in the case of um, RA, RA2, RA3, you see the maximums that are pretty generous. So um, it's, I don't know if there's any questions on this, if you had a chance to really look at it. But um, it is, in some respects, it's changing somewhat in terms of the height, the elimination of the, of the minimum lot size. And then in, case of, in the case of some of the setbacks, minimum side yard setbacks um, for um, the RA1 are, are actually increasing a little bit, and then the RA2 are increasing slightly. Um, RA3 is in, and RB are more or less uh, generally consistent. I have no real input on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Looks fine to me. I vote yes. There we go. <laughs> All right. Good. <laughs> And commercial zoning district regulations. So here we have, um, you know, in this case, uh, maximum floor area ratios um, within our um, C1, C2 districts. And um, again, just promoting more density. Um, the front yard setback in the C1 district um, is actually zero. I mean, so if you think of our downtown West Dallas area, all of the buildings for the most part are right up to the property line, right up to the sidewalk. Um, so if we build a new city hall, it's going to have to get pushed forward. If we build a new city hall, the you know the I guess the maximum front yard setback is saying build it up to up to the we property could give our, line. We could give ourselves a variance as no, well. But, but yeah. I mean that's that's what you're talking about, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so that's what we're talking about. So I guess with this though, there is the, <laughs> the appeal process within the setback, the bulk requirements. You do have an appeal in this case uh, for for these setbacks and, and coverages. But um, you know this is. This is what's proposed. And remind us, what's the, the floor area ratio? So the maximum is a two-story building. Is that what that so is? that that is a complicated uh, a Two complicated subject. Yeah, it, okay. it's about it's a it's it's like a ratio of the size of the lot to the size of the building. And actually, since we wrote this, we've been looking at this further, and we want to simplify things more. Even licensed architects have a hard time sometimes determining what a floor area ratio is going to be when they're envisioning a building so we're going to switch to just a height require a height maximum um, it, we don't include that in this because the draft we shared with you we didn't come up with that yet we didn't we didn't think that far ahead yet and we've kind of looked at this even further and we think the floor area ratio is for most of the commercial districts it's going to be too complicated for somebody to figure out we want to keep things as simple as possible with our code so we're going to switch to a height most likely we just hadn't gotten to that yet when we uh, shared it with you guys originally. Okay. Yeah. So, in the, yeah, in this case, if it's stated as 2.0, or if, let's just say 1.0 C4, it's probably the easiest one to understand. Is you can, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So if you have a 10,000 square foot lot, you can have a 10,000 square foot building. You know, of course, you have to factor in setbacks, and if it you want parking, you have to factor that in. Building with, but two stories. Exactly. You can go up. Right. Yeah. That's what it means. Yeah. Yeah, what if I want to build a 28-story building? <laughs> yeah. You can invite him to West Dallas. Right? <laughs> well, that means you probably already met with Patrick Schloss yeah. and he said keep it under 72 floors or and something. Yeah, yeah, right. I, I'm kind of joking, but I'm kind of serious. What, what does our code say uh, about a proposed 28-story building? So, and what do you propose, uh, to, if any, in, in the changes? So right now, the code says as long as the floor area ratio is a certain amount, it's fine. So basically, you can have a big lot with a smaller tower that goes pretty tall, and that's okay in, in some cases. Um, what we're proposing right now is essentially kind of keeping with that. But what we're gonna, when we update this, we're gonna say, you know, we're gonna have a set height limit in in every commercial district. So, in I think you know I think in I, I guess I wish we had this uh, included in here, yeah. but. I, I think in our next proposal that we will share with you guys um, when, we, when we actually bring this to plan commission and to council again, 
um, there would be a height limit of, you know, say 65 feet in our C2 district. So it would essentially only allow for maybe a five five story building maximum with smaller floors or you could do a four story with taller floors but we would have these kind of set height limits and then if somebody were to come with, to us with a big tower and we wanted that we could set we could do a variance for them and kind of you know that it would still be possible but it would just have to go through it yeah. would take more time for yeah, them to have get discretion through. perfect to do that's so. the answer yeah. i want to hear yep. thank you um next slide is um to clarify some of the regulations for accessory buildings, um, Vince, this to your point, um, with respect to the height, uh, in some cases, yeah, Vince, we have, um, uh, we had garages with very tall walls and, uh, or steeper roof pitches that were, that looked very large, like commercial buildings. Um, since that time, we actually uh, proposed an ordinance to the Common Council some years, maybe two yeah, or three years a ago, years and ago, yeah. we've adjusted that somewhat to um, allow for up to a 10 foot high uh, sidewall, exterior wall, yeah. and then with uh, up to an 18 foot high um, uh, building height, not to exceed the you know the principal building on the lot. So we've I think we've addressed. I know there there have been some that have that have happened, um, but we've we've adjusted our ordinance since that yeah, time. We, yeah, I, I think it was a great idea, Steve. You know, in, in all fairness, the neighbors they all raise hell about it. You know, because yeah. it really doesn't match. You know, I mean. Uh, there was something that happens that's over now, you know. Yeah. So. Uh, but with respect to um, the actual accessory buildings, though, um, so we have a couple, the three different types of accessory buildings. In the first column, here. or I'm sorry, the second column over from where it's Boot. under bulk control, it says accessory that's dwelling units. Okay. And then the next column is garage. And then there's other accessory buildings. Um, so, for instance, um, the, the height of an accessory dwelling unit, we're seeing a max exterior wall height of 20 feet. Or height of or or height of principal structure, whichever is less. Um, so we're just trying to, you know, certainly if you're going to have a, a a unit above a garage, you know, a 10 foot high wall isn't going to cut it because it's that 10 first 10 feet is going to be probably for the the vehicles, and yes. then above that, you'll have you know the uh, the living space above sure. that. Um, and just moving across in terms of height with a garage, really no change there. 18 feet as it is now within the code. And uh, not to exceed the height of a principal building, I guess whichever is whichever is less, and then other accessory building max height of 15 feet. So, for instance, um, a shed, uh, a storage shed in your backyard. You know, if you're a lawn mowing equipment or snowblower, that shouldn't exceed 15 feet in height. And then the size requirements for accessory dwelling unit: the max size of 650 square feet, or or 50 percent of the principal structure. So, um, you know, whichever whichever is less. Um, and then the garage max of a thousand feet, which is today's standard, and then the shed or other accessory building is 150 square feet, which is current. Um, the rest of these are, are really, I mean, for the accessory dwelling units, that's pro primarily the, the main you know change here that's happening. Um, we're saying you have to have a minimum separation or setback between the principal building and your accessory dwelling unit of about 10 feet. Um, and then the front front setback, you know, based it needs to be 60 feet back from the front lot line, and that's your principal building will be in the front front of portion of the lot, and then your uh, accessory dwelling unit could be behind it. And you can have setbacks of three feet and five feet from an alley. Um, but everything else is, is primarily the same. The other two columns for garages and accessory buildings are the same. Sure, Mr. Chair, um, going back to the home occupancy for the accessory dwelling, would this allowed to have home occupancy as well? I mean, um, business, business in Yeah. Because technically it will Maybe be- your backyard <laughs> little place, your- Exactly, we could uh, turn this into our little business. So the, the way the home occupancy restrictions are written is that there's a locate, there's kind of a principal use- um, Of the building. There's a, the principal use has to be met, so it has to be in a one unit dwelling a two-unit dwelling or a residential condominium. So I guess if it was if somebody had bought an ADU as a condo, like and they owned it in that way, it would be okay. But otherwise, it would have to be in a one-unit dwelling or a two-unit dwelling. So I think, I think unlikely. What she's asking is if I own my home, mm -hmm. I build my little ADU, thank ADU you. out back. Could I run my, home my art studio? my dog grooming business out of there. As long as it doesn't occupy more than 25% of that dwelling unit. Oh, and at 600 square feet, 25%, you wouldn't 
Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, pretty small. small. Yeah. Good, good point. Get a sink. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> depending on small dogs. Yeah. Get a sink. Yeah. 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 Very small dogs. Smaller than that possum. So a, a shed at 150 square feet is about 12 by 12, but it could be 15 feet tall? Yeah. That's a weird dimension. That's weird. That's taller than it is wide. Yep. That's. Yeah, I guess that might. That would include. Yeah. But it could have a flat roof. Well, you got to have a pitch on a roof. Yeah, but it could be a flat roof. It you could, could be. Roof on a shed. It could be. I got a shed in the back, and it's got a pitch yeah. roof to match the house. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, I guess up, you know, just updating some of the uh, regulations for structures and yards, really pretty much the same as what's in our current code, just more in a table format. Three new um, features are being added for rain barrels, compost barrels, and uh, like planter boxes, whether it be a square foot garden or an actual uh, <coughs> annual garden. Um, so, you know, and basically what this means is that you can have these types of features, these accessory structures in your yard, and um, Say for instance, like a compost, it can't be in your front yard because it's, that, that cell is blank, uh, but it could be in your side yard or your rear yard um, as, a, as a limited use. And by limited use, again, there's some conditions. The conditions would be subject to our health, our health department, uh, section chapter seven of the health, uh, which basically covers, you know, they don't want it to become a, a food source for, for rats and you know, mm -hmm. it has to be kept in a certain manner. Um, so that's currently regulated in Chapter 7. So that's that's why that is called off in the limitation. I don't see satellite dish on there. Remember the old school? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That didn't see beehive either. Did rain no. barrels before no. have to be permitted? No. no. They were just, we, our code just ignored them. So oh, this is. So you're just adding yeah. it. Okay. M M we actually, we, we consulted with MMSD. They had kind of prepared a some <laughs> code overview kind of stuff before and they just recommended adding some things to make it more clear for people yeah. essentially is what we're doing do we right. not allow yeah. beehives uh i don't know if we do or not that'd be something i have to and it's like one of those do we allow chickens and yeah you know, well that's different know, yeah well and, and there's honey beehives right, we don't allow chickens no we don't allow chickens don't but allow chickens. it would okay. probably be in our health chapter i mean as far as whether or not beehives are a thing I thought we we certainly talked about that at length. That's I'm not sure where it ended up. Oh, so. We can we can look into that. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know. If, uh, we don't allow beehives. I'm gonna take a look at chapter seven real quick and just hit beehive once and see what. Because a beehive would be a structure. I mean, a honey beehive is a structure. Yeah, when they build There's the other structure. kinds of yeah. beehives too that are not structure. I mean, like no, it's mason spinning. bees. I have mason bees. I know people. With, I know people with beehives. Like a big bathhouse, please. Well, it's taking taking a while to search here, so. We'll get back to you on that. We'll get back to you on that. All right. So the last, the last big change we'll talk about is to our parking code. Um, so this is our proposed motor vehicle parking table. So the big thing here is that we're going to be shifting from a minimum-based parking code to a maximum-based parking code. So what this means is right now our regulations are basically set at, we say, you know, here's the estimated peak, you know, kind of peak number of cars for this for this site. You need to have more parking than that, so you need to have an excess of parking, and that wastes a lot of parking lots. That that's why we have Highway 100 with huge parking lots everywhere. Yeah, it's no. there's it's filling our city's land with this unproductive, not really you know lowers our taxable value. It also discourages development by you know increasing the cost to developers. Um, so this is a really a big, a, a key strategy that we think will be helpful to building the city's taxable value, promoting redevelopment along corridors like Highway 100. Um, Common Council would still have the authority to adjust parking requirements like we do, like you guys do right now. So if there is some sort of special case, that, that's still something we can be flexible with. Um, the right shows this uh, proposed table. So just a couple highlights. Um, something like a Malta, you know, if you had an apartment building, um, you'd have to have um, you could not have more than two parking stalls per unit. That's you know, uh, that's kind of what we would say. Per unit or bedroom? Per unit, per unit. And and usually what we see with our and we'll we'll show you some examples of recent apartment buildings that have been built. But a lot of times with apartments, uh, you know, there's a a mix of units in the thing. A lot of one a lot of one bedroom units, 
a couple two bedrooms, maybe one or two three bedrooms. So a lot of times it'll balance. It, it kind of balances out where you know some units. One point two or something. Yeah, a lot of units like like I have an apartment. I don't have a car. You know, like then there's. You don't have a car. I don't have a car. There's other people. <laughs> Bart's brother. Yeah, that's right. The new Bart. Yeah, but then there's other people in my building who have two cars, so it kind of balances out. Um, uh, sorry for exaggerating. No, you're, no oh, it's all good. Okay. It's all yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, another thing, you know, you might see in retail, we'll say now you can't have more than three cars per amount of uh, amount of floor area. That's kind of flipping the regulation we had before on its head, basically. Kind of the same strategy, just a different number and maximum type. And then the ones with asterisks you'll see, uh, those are just going to be subject to special permit reviews. So it gives us even more flexibility and can be more case specific in, in those ones. Uh, so we kind of did, we, we did some study on what this impact from switching from a minimum to maximum base parking code would be, and it looks all good. Uh, most businesses would not be really impacted at all. The changes are kind of, you know, the amount of parking they have would have met it before and it would meet it now. It, the, it's kind of flipping over and under it. So. Um, what we do see, though, is that these large empty parking lots, um, the examples we have here are of Home Depot, the former Sam's Club, and Dollar General. These are, you know, big building, or these are buildings with big parking lots, um, and th they often provided more parking than even our minimum suggested. So Home Depot, they built 540 spaces. Our code said you have to build at least 485, so they went like 60 over what we had, what we had said. Our new code would say you can't have more than 474, so they would have been limited. That would have saved us 70 parking spaces. That could have been more building area. They could have split off of split off the lot. It could have been landscaping, green space. Yeah, there's a lot of things that could have been more productive for our city than just parking spaces that aren't ever used. Absolutely. Um, the table on the right then, this shows some of our more desirable developments. Um, some of these big projects that we've had in recent years. We've had to um, have you guys do waivers for the, the have give variances to them for their parking, um, and that kind of creates an extra burden on them to get that done. Um, so in in this new code, they would meet it without needing a variance. So for example, Sona, um, the building you know that's being built right now, they're providing 154 stalls for their apartments. Our code right now says they have to do at least 176. So they do a, a very extensive study of the market whenever you know they're going to propose a new building so that they don't have to do more parking than they need to because it's really expensive. And now they can do that and they don't even need to worry about the variance. So th this is the effect we want to have is going to be ha had on our, on our properties. Any questions about this before we move on? Two things. Yeah. I noticed when I drive down National Avenue at yeah. night, there's a lot of cars on National Avenue from, I assume, from the west already anyways. What happens when we do this with Sona? I think there's cars... I think national the on-street parking in National Avenue. I mean, we could manage that somehow, change it to four-hour parking instead of. I think it's unregulated right now. Yep. And I don't know. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure every tenant at the West gets an underground parking space. It's not an additional fee. Yeah, it's, it's still, additional fee. I think. It yeah. is an additional yeah. fee. Pretty sure it is. That's yeah, sixty dollars. I heard it. Yeah. How much? Sixty to seventy dollars a month. Yeah. So those people are choosing not to park in the underground and getting an overnight park permit to park on our street. Yep. Yeah. There, this kind of brings up a, a good point about other things you can do with parking. And one thing I know a lot of cities are looking at or turning to again are um, doing paid, having paid on street parking. Uh, it's a good way to manage parking and also generate revenue for the city. So that's, I mean, just to. This is not part of the zoning code thing at all, but there, there's other policy options, you know, in the future that if, if there is trouble with on-street parking, our, doing things like that. Our overnight parking is cheap. Yeah, <coughs> it is. I mean, I think it is like 30 cents a day or something, right? Is it 100 bucks a year? Yeah. 25 a quarter? Yeah. Yeah, it is. But that's a different conversation. Yep. But I, I just wanted to bring that up. I'm, I'm in favor of this, you know. And then my next question is, I'm thinking of pick and save that I frequent over here. There's essentially a cut-through road, if you picture the cut-through road that people use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever see a single car parked on the west side of that Never. cut-through road. Right. Yeah. Now those are up to no good. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was your car, though. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> well, the, the, west, the west, call it third, of the pick-and-save parking lot over here on 68th and National. There's never a car parked. Are we going to tell these property owners, guess what? Remember when we when you came here 20 years ago or whatever, we made you have this parking lot? 
no, you don't need to anymore. Why don't you think about developing that? Are we gonna? Are we gonna? Yeah. Are, I think we should. I do too. We go Marty, I, I think those areas are always open for development, though. <laughs> well, they came in. They put the service station there. But they might be allowed. Yeah, no, but they might. They might think, oh, this, there's no way. This, the, oh no, the city made us have all this parking. I think we. I think we need to yeah. tell the Home Depots. I agree. And, oh, I and the yeah. pick and saves that we've changed. Just hey, you know, FYI. If you're thinking about doing something else, yep. You know where, where, you know, but that might trigger a whole parking lot re and then more landscaping and all that. It might not be worth their while. Oh, but I think if we're going to do this, let them decide. Let, yeah. we, they should. We should tell these big property owners that have this yeah. big sea of asphalt. Right. That we shouldn't wait for the new guy to come through. Yeah. I think that's a great that. idea, Patrick. Patrick, Patrick. That, once we pass this, we can work with you guys yeah, to get I mean, that out there. Yeah, me like too. Does nothing, and then they just pile snow there yes. or something. Yep. And it's just not the way. But it's even. I just had this conversation <laughs> last week about <laughs> the our downtown parking lot. Yeah, we have we're, we have too we have, we have too much free parking in the downtown. Yeah, we do. Free we, parking. Uh, and yeah, thank you. We have a parking problem. No. We have a parking problem in the sense that we have a surplus. Yes. And um, that's really with the land we have, we're landlocked. We have to use. We gotta find more. Have. Also More new construction, parking. net new construction. Mm -hmm. yeah, we see <laughs> and then what we've seen at the corners is parking is built into the development. Mm -hmm. it, you know, more it's like you park underneath and you walk up. I mean, mm -hmm. the idea is um, you've got to get good economic power to generate that development. Um, that's the, that's the thing. You know, and it's that pays the higher rent. But that I think a lot of big box stores after COVID here and as cars, how we use cars change. They're going to look at how to maximize that land. Yeah, they should. Because I see, you know, the pick up the groceries and leave. And that's the new element. So there aren't people just staying there for a right. long period of time. Really for five minutes. And you're paying when they're minutes. on their leases. They're paying something called a camp cost each month for all the maintenance of those parking lots. And they're probably going, well, why are we paying this when people are just coming and going? Um, that's yeah. that's one thing. Um, <laughs> two is you know a lot of young generation. That one. <laughs> uh, they don't own a car, but if they use a car, they're going to use Lyft or Uber yeah. and things like that. So they they don't even have a car that parks. And I think through the evolution of the car, it may just even just bring you to the front door, drop you off, you do whatever. Come back and pick you up. And it'll come back and pick you up. So where that car goes in the meantime, or yeah. there's shared cars. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have to think of where the future. <laughs> Cruising, going under. I think it's going, to, <laughs> yeah. it's going to evolve and change. So this land mass that we have, it'd be great to green it up, the whole parking lot. I mean, we do development. We got to do stormwater retention. Uh, anytime you disrupt, disrupt an acre or so. So, um, yeah, we should maximize that. Now, yeah, I agree with. Uh, that is the next thing because a lot of it, what we face is leases that say I get so much parking in front of my place, and it's in their lease. So the owner that leases wants to develop it, but the store may not want to relinquish those parking spots. Mr. Chair, well, I agree with you with that parking lot next to the apartment by pick and save. It'll be a whole other apartment building. Yeah. yeah. The the uh, fact has been occurring that a lot of homeless people with vans and stuff <laughs> like that off and on have been getting complaints from uh, pick and save where people leave their apartment and just stay there overnight. You know, they sleep there, you know, and uh, so the police have to go there and tell them to right. get out of there, you know. It worry, happens it's often. It's coming into my district with, the re with redistricting. Pick and say it's coming problem. into my district. You're done. I my know. Problem. And you can have it then. Yeah, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. Already on I'm glad. It. Already on it. So we've got one more really quick thing. I know we've taken up a lot of your time, so we'll get through it quick. We are also going to be adding a very minimal light burden bark bicycle parking requirement. Right now, we're basically... We, in practice, we require a lot of developments to add a, add a bike rack yep. when we do it. And we're just kind of codifying that practice so it's very clear. So when they come to us, they know what to expect. Yep. Um, and so you know, these will be just really to ensure that there's this accessible bike parking throughout the city with good location and design standards. It's kind of advancing our complete streets policy. Um, and th they're, they're very minimal. If you're a very small business, you aren't going to be forced to add a bike rack unless you're more than... 3,000 square feet. So a lot of businesses won't even be impacted. What's an example of a 3,000? Do you know off the top of your head what 3,000? 3,000 square, 3, square um, feet. Maybe 30 feet, 100 feet deep. Yeah, nothing in our downtown would be that, I don't well, think. Well, there's probably yeah, something. There might maybe be a couple. Like, uh, big the co-work space would be probably that. Um, 
put the over that. Um, but I like bread peddlers, really small space. Uh, the uh, Mark Lutz's uh, bake sale, that's uh, only 900 square feet. So, but it's in, in those cases, we have, you know, bike racks that we can put in the city right of way. So it's. Yeah. And a bike rack in the city of right of way might satisfy the needs for yep. two yeah. or three businesses on the street. Yeah, and that's, right. a, yeah, that's a good point. At least it, for it, it, they, they just have to have within, I think, 100 feet of their entrance. If there's a bike rack, then they're, then they're good. They're served. So. Um, and then, Tony, I don't know if you want to finish this Every off. Every light pole is a bike rack, too. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. not. Voice of experience. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. that's, yeah. that's right. Be. Not right. Do that. If you have the right lock. Yeah, yeah. yes. So yeah. with all of that, we just uh, want to let you know that we're sending out a community survey uh, tomorrow through our communications department. And we would really appreciate it if you Spread the word. would like to send it out to your constituents. Uh, that would be great to get them involved. and give them a chance to um, just have it weigh in and have some input on, on this important zoning code update. Are we going to have a link on the website for that, Tony, or is it going to be... Yeah, we'll yeah. add it to okay. our, our website as well and then share it on our social. Um, <coughs> give it, send it yeah. all to you all. Tony, where did you take that picture from? It's, it's, it looks familiar to me, yeah. That's from Chicago. It's, uh, oh, it's Scotland? We, we have to have, one part of a survey is just yeah, taking cool. pictures of different types of places and seeing which ones people prefer yeah, yeah. to kind of get a sense of that. Clark Street, maybe. It's 60th and Burnham in about uh, five years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. I like it's it. It's your old barber shop. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, it used to be my shop. Yeah, no, it's just a kind of junkyard, I yeah. think. Yeah, he's doing it from his house now. He just admitted to it. Yeah. I like that. I like her, Dad. I like her. I yeah, think this is away from her. <laughs> Let's pay attention to Tony. <laughs> Just a couple more. Okay, so today is February 8th. That's in the orange. That's today. Sending out the community survey tomorrow. Uh, our first option for our timeline is in a couple weeks, we would present this to Planning Commission and then have a public hearing uh, with the Common Council on um, March 17th. That's our fast option. Our slower option is to meet with Planning Commission on March 23rd and present to uh, have a public hearing on April 7th. Um, I would not pick March 17th. Why March 17th? It's <laughs> yeah. a Thursday. That's well, it's it's shifted because of Patrick's Patty's Day. Day. There's an election on um, on the Tuesday. Tuesday, the typical Tuesday council. There's, I, I believe there's a. Not in March. That's, that's, that, March. that's April. That's April. April. Did we get that wrong? Yeah. <laughs> I, I did right. flip my Council dates around. <laughs> I flipped my dates around <laughs> recently, so it was probably Patrick's me. Day. Right. Yeah. February. Dan and the mayor. He's not going to be there. It's yeah. the third. Okay. February fifteenth was moved yeah. to February seventeenth, but right. March fifteenth we do have a council okay. meeting. That's okay. that's my bad, y'all. <laughs> no, no, we don't have one on March. Nope, we don't have one on March fifteenth. Okay. Got it the first and the third. The first and the third. Yeah. Yes. So in any uh, March? March? any comments yeah. on, on either of these? Yeah, two we're back to our normal council meetings. First yeah, and third. Yeah, the first Tuesday is March first, and, and the third, third is the fifteenth. Fifteenth. Right. So we could right we could go the fifteenth. Fifteenth. Yes. Just ignore the typo. Just ignore it. Long presentation. Last slide. Yeah, now it's out. Well, thank you all for your time and your input. Thank you. Thanks for all your hard work, guys. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good. All right. You're going to call someone on Patty's Motion to adjourn. Oh, I move we adjourn. Second. All in favor, aye. Aye. <laughs>